所以让我开心的，就是他能够这样的笑容，看不出身体有什么病痛。希望他能够健健康康最好。Founded in 1976, Home Nursing Foundation is one of the largest and most established home health care providers in Singapore. While we started out solely providing home health care services, we now have started two daycare centres in Haogang and Wangkok to help look after seniors in the daytime when their family members are busy with work commitments. We also provide caregiver training at these centres. Our suite of home health care services include home nursing services where our nurses provide nasogastric tube changes, urinary catheter changes, medication management, caregiver training and support. 我叫蔡彩凤，七十岁了。二零一零年我确诊了癌症，二零一八年癌症复发，我还要照顾我孩子。蔡玉贤今年三十二岁，一岁多，因为发了高烧，所以伤到了脑跟语言神经，所以他现在不能说话，右手左脚不顺利，因为他不能够正常的吃固体食物。只能够通过鼻管来摄取营养牛奶。教育基金每个月来换鼻灵丢，提供免费的鼻灵丢。来换这个鼻灵丢的时候也没有收费，我可以省了一点那个金钱了。而且我不用担心去找护士来换这个鼻灵丢了。那我们十三年这样了，接受家护基金的服务了。Our doctors provide home medical care such as regular health reviews and prescription of medications. We also provide home rehabilitation services such as physiotherapy, occupational therapy and speech therapy. Home personal care services assist patients with daily self-care activities like toileting as well as basic housekeeping, medication reminders and maintenance exercises. At our wellness centres, we offer daycare services to help lessen the load of family members or caregivers who are unable to care for their loved ones during the day due to work commitments. Our professional care team, which includes physiotherapists, occupational therapists and nurses, come together to design the most personalised activities that are suited for our seniors' needs and interests. A range of centre-based nursing services that include tube changes, medication management, wound management and chronic disease monitoring are also available for seniors who require them. My name is Isnin Hamid Hamza, 16 years old. At the moment, I'm in the rehab centre in DK because I'm one of the stroke victims. I at the moment doing therapy. Actually, I don't know about this place. At the time, my wife admitted to this place. She got Parkinson because she cannot talk properly. And my daughter was said me come here. So after some time, I told my daughter, okay, I think I can give a try coming here. Last year, July, until now, I got a very good therapist here with me. When I come here first, I can't even walk properly. I have to use the wheelchair. Until now, I can walk properly. I'm getting the momentum again. So I really thank her very much. The people here, they are very, very friendly and very experienced. They know what they're doing. They know what they want to give you. I really enjoy it. We recognise that many family members are thrusted into the role of a caregiver unexpectedly. Our caregiver training and support programme aims to equip them with skills and techniques to better care for their loved ones and for them to understand the resources available in the community. Our desire is to empower our patients to live with joy despite the circumstances and challenges that they may face. We want to be here for our patients and clients who need us today and for those who will need us tomorrow. We will become a hub for home health care services, a go-to pillar of support for caregivers and patients 
to assess the comprehensive services that we provide. We hope that you will join us as our community of supporters, donors, volunteers and partners to help our patients and caregivers walk this journey with joy. Are we going out now? A very good morning to esteemed guests, ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome to Home Nursing Foundation's inaugural interdisciplinary care conference through sickness and in health a conference of end-of-life care for homebound elders. I am Shereen, your MC for today. We would like to thank you for taking precious time off your busy schedule to join us in the event, and we hope that you will find the program insightful and useful relevant for your own practice. So today we have a very exciting hybrid program. Other than the guests in the auditorium today, we have another group of attendees who are now live on Zoom. So we'd like to say a thank for them who, are, who have also taken their time off. So behind me, there is a QR code on the screen. You may scan the QR code and you would find the e-program booklet for today's conference. Inside the booklet, there will be the schedule, conference material, as well as our in integrated thematic care pathway for end-of-life care. We have an exciting program lined up for you today. There will be three keynote speeches as well as a care discussion. And this care discussion, we have panel experts as well as healthcare professionals who work very closely with the chronic sick elders. And we hope that you will find the session useful. So with that, Please join me to rise and welcome our guest of honour for today. We are delighted to have Ms. Rahayu Mazam, Senior Parliamentary Secretary to the Ministry of Health for gracing our event today. Thank you, Ms. Rahayu. Without further ado, let's start the program proper. We would now like to invite Dr. Christina Tiong, Chief Executive Officer of Home Nursing Foundation on stage to deliver her opening speech. Dr. Tiong, please. Ms. Rahayu Mazam, Senior Parliamentary Secretary, Ministry of Health, Community Partners, Friends and Colleagues, Good morning and a very warm welcome to HNF's case conference on end-of-life care for frail homebound elders. I'm delighted to see you here. As the largest home health care provider in Singapore, we have seen many frail elderly patients bounce back and forth frantically between hospital and home in the final years of their lives. My own mother is one such example. To many, death is a hard topic to broach. Family members find it discomforting to talk to their dying loved ones about their wishes. Out of fear, from denial, and mostly good intent to spare their loved ones from the burden of thinking about these unpleasant but important issues. Often there is a sense of helplessness or aversion in acknowledging or addressing their needs and concerns as it could have been coloured by bad experiences or fraught with unknown and uncertainties. Avoidance of these crucial conversations results in the lack of clear goals and care plans 
aligned with the loved ones and care professionals across various care settings. Although talking with a loved one about death can be an emotional minefield, I submit to you that it is far worse to sweep it under the carpet and deny our loved ones the opportunity to share their wishes and concerns. Candor and knowledge are keys to addressing end-of-life issues holistically. Often we are not fully aware of the intricacies of care at the end of life. We tend to compartmentalize, thinking of it as an eligibility threshold, where we shift our focus entirely to the relief of physical symptoms and provision of basic care when the extension of life is no longer possible. However, end-of-life care is much more than that. It is also about empowering our patients in decision-making, acknowledging their emotions, and treating them with tender respect even at the lowest moments, while providing emotional and practical support to family members so that they learn how best to care for their loved ones and cope with their eventual passing. As healthcare professionals and community care providers, we play an integral role to those who find themselves in the face of death. Our practical assistance and calm assurance can be comforting to those grappling with the impending loss of a loved one or their own death, reducing the pain or turmoil that they experience. A thoughtful and well-executed end-of-life care plan is the result of a concerted effort by nurses, doctors, social workers, caregivers and patients themselves every step of the way. Seeing the challenges our patients and family face today, HNF is determined to support our patients with a warm, peaceful and dignified exit surrounded by their loved ones. With this in mind, we devised this conference to address the ways we can provide effective home-based care to frail patients through the incorporation of transdisciplinary approaches. As greater emphasis is being placed on aging and dying in place, we see the need to be part of the collective efforts and develop relevant competencies amongst our colleagues and caregivers. Through interdisciplinary discussions and sharing by field experts, the conference hopes to create awareness about the complex nature of end-of-life care planning and implementation, and to manage and integrate the viewpoints of different stakeholders in this journey. While we understand that much work remains to be done in building capabilities and capacity for palliative care in the community, HNF hopes to contribute to the knowledge and practice by documenting and sharing our aspirations and then learning and growing together. It takes a village, an intricately interlaced network of brave and dedicated people like you to empower our loved ones patients and frail elders to live joyfully in our community up to their very last breath. We hope that through this conference, you will glean useful insights and be inspired with the possibilities of how, together, we might gift our patients with the grace and quality of life that we too wish for ourselves. Thank you and have a wonderful conference. Thank you, Dr. Tiong. Now may we please invite our guest of honour today, Ms. Rahayu, on stage to share a few words with us. A big round of applause for Ms. Rahayu, please. Dr. Christina Cheong, CEO of Home Nursing Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I'm delighted to see the good turnout today in support of our end-of-life care for frail homebound seniors. I also thank the Home Nursing Foundation, HNF, for their contributions to Singapore's healthcare sector, especially with their plans to scale up and increase their capabilities within the community palliative care sphere. Singapore has a rapidly aging population. By 2030, one in four Singaporeans will be aged 65 and above, an increase from one in five today. Against this backdrop, we expect the number of patients who need palliative care to rise. Our healthcare system and society will need to build capabilities quickly now to be in time to meet these future palliative care needs. 
Surveys done by Lian Foundation in 2014 and Singapore Management University in 2019 showed that three in four Singaporeans prefer to pass on at home. In reality, however, only one in four passed on at home. With this in mind, we need to work towards enabling more deaths at home rather than in hospitals to fulfil the wishes of our population. Our palliative care efforts will be anchored within the community as a complement and continuation of our Healthy SG efforts. We will also continue to refine our care models and upskill our manpower to provide timely access to quality palliative care in the community. There are three shifts we should make and partners like HNF will play a critical role in the sector being able to make these shifts. First, we need to increase the palliative care capacity. Over the years, we have increased the places available for patients to be cared for in centres or at home. Our palliative care providers together provide more than 3,100 places since 2020. The number of day hospice places has also increased since 2017 by over 60% to about 160 places today. This is in addition to about 250 inpatient hospice palliative care service beds we have at present, with inpatient hospices, community hospitals and nursing homes for patients with more complex palliative needs. We will also expand capacity within the home care sector to ensure that those who wish to pass on at home can do so peacefully. Home palliative care providers will train and support caregivers to provide day-to-day -day care. In return, caregivers will be supported through services like home-based respite care to help them cope with their loved ones' care needs and relieve their stress for an identified period of time. This can help to reduce the risk of caregiver burnout. MOH is also working with our partners in the sector to address other barriers to continued care at home, such as equipment availability. Second, we will need to raise palliative care capabilities across the wider healthcare sector, so that healthcare professionals in all settings can manage patients with palliative needs with palliative care specialists focusing on the most complex cases. MOH has invested significantly in palliative care training for healthcare workers, for example, the Graduate Diploma in Palliative Medicine has trained more than 100 physicians. For nurses, there are training courses offered by our nursing schools. Most recently, we rolled out the Palliative Nursing Competency Framework. The framework highlights the job roles and skills competencies of nurses in caring for end-of-life patients. Social workers, therapists and other allied health professionals also play important roles in identifying and caring for the patient and starting conversations about end-of-life care. In particular, home care organisations such as HNF should be upskilled to continue providing support for their clients at their end-of-life stage instead of handing such cases over to specialist palliative care providers. Similarly, nursing homes should also gradually be able to manage their end-of-life residents on site so that they too can spend their last days in a familiar environment. Take for example, Madam C, a 91-year-old resident of St Andrews Nursing Home, Henderson. After numerous hospitalisation episodes, she articulated her wish to spend her final days in the nursing home through her advanced care plan. For more than a year, the St Andrews Community Hospital Palliative Care team worked closely with the nursing home GP and nursing staff and equipped them with the skill sets to manage her care. Eventually, the St Andrews Nursing Home Henderson team was able to independently care for her through episodes of delirium, infections and progression of her kidney disease and she passed on in peace in the nursing home. This case illustrates the potential and capacity that the community has to offer to care for these patients. Third, we will need to raise palliative care awareness and change societal mindsets. As Dr. Christina Tiong mentioned earlier, it's very difficult conversations to have. The Singapore Hospital Council, Hospice Council, SHC, and the Agency for Integrated Care have run media campaigns and community engagement programs to raise public awareness and receptivity of annual life care and advanced care planning. In the next phase, we will work more closely with our health and community care partners, like all of you, to increase accessibility of advanced care planning so that we can honour the care preferences of our population. Through the collective efforts of numerous stakeholders like those of you seated here today, the palliative healthcare sector has made significant strides over the years. 
This gives me more confidence that we will be able to meet the challenges that lie ahead amid an evolving healthcare landscape. We have an exciting conference lineup today, which I'm sure will inspire everyone present as we learn from experts and from one another. So I wish you a fruitful day of learning and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Rahayu. May we invite you to remain on stage for us to present the token of appreciation. Dr. Tiong, please. The token of appreciation is a calligraphy artwork by Mr. Lim Che Ting, a senior at our HNF Wellness at Aokang. The character is Le in Chinese, which means joy in English, and this represents HNF's purpose to bring joy and dignity for our seniors in the community. Thank you, Ms. Rahayu. Thank you, Dr. Tiong. Before we begin the first keynote lecture, we would like to share that we will be flashing a QR code on the screen during each lecture. You may use the QR code to actively put in your Q&A, and the speakers will address them at the end of their sharing. So please do not hold back. We would love to hear from you. Our first expert keynote speaker is the internationally renowned Dr. Diane Meyer. Those who are familiar with palliative care would know her. She is the founder, director emeritica, and strategic medical advisor of the Center to Advance Palliative Care in the United States. With more than 25 years of experience in her field, she has penned more than 200 journals, textbooks, and also set up guidelines protocols in her country. Today, we are honored to share with you a pre-recorded sharing of her lecture. Palliative care futurists, matching care to our patients' Good morning, needs. Everyone. Let us sit I'm back. I'm delighted to be here with you today, um, and I only wish I could be there in person to meet all of you. Today, I'll be speaking to you about what I think needs to happen in order for care of frail older adults and people living with serious illness is actually delivered in a manner that meets their needs. And so I called this palliative care futurist because health systems across the world are still highly focused in hospitals and acute care systems. Um, and the future is going to require a major shift in resources, attention, training, and clinicians into the community setting, particularly people's homes um, and long-term care facilities. I have no conflicts of interest to report. Let me begin by saying that healthcare spending, regardless of what country you live in, is very highly concentrated among a very few, very sick, very costly patients. And in the United States, at least, and I have no doubt this is also true in Singapore, the top 1% of spenders account for a quarter of all healthcare spending in the United States. And the latest data says that the top 5% of spenders on healthcare account for 57% of all spending. So patients are not equally sick and not therefore not equally expensive. And in fact, a very small number of highly complex patients account for the great majority of a country's healthcare spending. And when you think about that and you think about the value equation and the value equation, as I'm sure you all know, is quality in the numerator and cost in the denominator. So a high quality intervention is one that saves millions of lives at a cost of little or no money. So a good example of that is clean drinking water, which is a very high value public health intervention or vaccinations. Again, both save and protect millions of lives at very, very low cost per person. On the other hand, low value medical interventions are interventions that don't add much to quality of life 
don't improve the patient's underlying condition and are delivered at very, very high cost per person. And at least in New York City, where I work, there is a great deal of low value care being delivered. Examples include people with advanced stroke or dementia who are receiving care in medical intensive care units that will not restore them to any semblance of health and is being delivered at a cost of fifteen to twenty thousand dollars per day per patient. But because of that concentration of risk and concentration of spending, and the impact that palliative care has on both the numerator and the denominator, improving quality and reducing cost, its principles and practices are central to rational healthcare policy for any government. Um, this is Mr. and Mrs. C. Um, I met them in the emergency department at Mount Sinai roughly two years ago. When I met him, he was 88 years old, had a diagnosis of dementia um, in his medical record, and he was in the emergency department for severe low back pain that, according to the chart, was due to spinal stenosis and degenerative joint disease, arthritis. He described his pain as an eight out of a possible 10 on admission to the emergency department, and he was taking very large doses of Tylenol, acetaminophen, doses that were bordering on toxic to his liver without benefit, without relief. As it turned out, reviewing his chart, this was his fourth visit to the emergency department in a two month period. The three prior visits were due again to back pain um, and one due, due to a fall and one due to agitation, restlessness, and a delirium essentially that turned out to be due to a fecal impaction due to constipation. His 83-year-old wife was totally stressed and overwhelmed, um, really did not want to be in the emergency department with him, but didn't know what else to do. So he was just really upset that he had ended up back in the emergency department again and was, when he was talking, saying, basically, get me out of here. Don't take me to the hospital. And this is what his wife said to me. He hates being in the hospital, but what could I do? The pain was terrible, and I couldn't reach the doctor. I couldn't even move him myself. So I called the ambulance. It was the only thing I could do. And this may not be true in Singapore, but in the United States, if you're a patient with a pain crisis or an acute medical problem after 5 p.m. and you call your doctor's office, you get a tape that tells you, that says the following. If this is a medical emergency, hang up now and call 911, which is the emergency call number. Um, and that really is the only care system that's available to many people after hours. So it shouldn't surprise us that patients facing a frightening situation, whether shortness of breath or an acute pain crisis, will end up over and over and over in the emergency department because it's really the only alternative that's available to them. Um, when it is after regular business hours. So um, the usual care situation that Mr. C had received before I and my medical student met him in the emergency department, four calls to 911 in a three month period, leading to four visits to the emergency department and three hospitalizations, which led on one of those hospitalizations, someone had put a bladder catheter into him. He developed a urinary tract infection and urosepsis, ended up in the intensive care unit briefly, um, had marked functional and cognitive decline as a consequence of the hospitalization and markedly worsened um, his poor wife's stress level. She was at his bedside from six in the morning until the nurses threw her out at late in the evening because she was so worried about him. When our team got involved, um, we did a few things. First of all, 
we couldn't give him a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug like ibuprofen because his renal function wouldn't tolerate it. So Tylenol, acetaminophen was not working. Anti-inflammatory drugs were unsafe because of his underlying renal dysfunction. And I decided to trial him on a very low dose of concentrated liquid morphine. And what we did was give, get uh, a prescription filled for uh, concentrated liquid morphine. It was 20 milligram per ml. And we gave him 0.1 ml, in other words, two milligrams of concentrated oral morphine. And we just stood there, me and the student, by his stretcher and waited to see, A, whether he had any adverse effects from this very, very low dose of morphine, and B, whether it provided any relief to the severe back spasm that he was experiencing. And about 40 minutes later, he was no different. He was still curled in a little ball, refusing to talk to anyone, refusing to talk to his wife, um, turning away from the nurses. And so I gave a second dose of um, two milligrams of morphine for a total of four milligrams of morphine, a very low dose. But remember, this is an 88-year-old, opioid-naive, frail older adult. And about 15 minutes later, he was markedly better. He had turned over on his back. He was holding his wife's hand. He was smiling at the nurses. He asked for help to walk to the bathroom, was able to walk to the bathroom with a one-person assist. So far from the drug being toxic to him, it not only relieved his pain, took the edge off his pain, but restored his mental status back closer to normal. And actually, there's quite a bit of data showing that pain is a very potent precipitant or cause of delirium. And that relief of pain is a very important mechanism to prevent and reduce delirium in older adults, particularly those who are hospitalized. So we gave him the low-dose morphine, and I realized that he had to have a mechanism to handle these recurrent low back pain episodes short of ending up in the emergency department. And we're very fortunate to have a medical house calls program at Mount Sinai. And I called the director of the program at this point, it's nine o'clock at night on a Thursday and explained the situation and asked if they could get in to see him tomorrow, the next day. Now they have a three month waiting list, but, um, because I've been around for a long time and know people, they agreed, to, they agreed to take him. So it's not a reliable service if you don't have connections, unfortunately. And the next day, um, they went into the home at nine o'clock in the morning to check on him. And the house calls practice has 24 seven coverage, meaning if you call at 7 p.m. because you have a pain crisis, you don't get a tape that tells you to call 911, you get a person calling you back within 10 to 15 minutes. And in that manner, they are able to man help families manage crises at home and help them avert these repeated visits to the emergency department. We had figured out that very low do a very low dose of morphine was adequate to relieve his pain and actually improved his mental status as the pain lessened. Um, I mentioned that the house calls practice has 24 seven phone coverage. Turned out that Mrs. C's only daughter lives in San Francisco um, and they hadn't wanted to worry her. So they hadn't been letting her know what was going on. Um, it turned out that they had also been very active members of their local faith community, but had not been going because of Mr. C's low back pain. So with their permission, we got in touch with their, their minister. Um, and that, of course, this faith community has a friendly visitor program for elderly shut-ins and arranged three times a week friendly visitors to come um, not only to um, relieve Mrs. C of some of the caregiver burden, but also to spend time with Mr. C so she could get out of the house, go shopping, see her friends, um, see the sky, get her hair cut, things like that. 
Um, we arranged Meals on Wheels because because of Mr. C's low back pain. Mrs. C had been unable to get out to get groceries. Um, they didn't have a computer. They didn't know anything about ordering food online. Um, and we were able to arrange um, meal deliveries for them um, so that the nutritional and food insecurity problems were also addressed. Um, we talked about the Friendly Visitor Program. So that was about two years ago. He has not once been back in the emergency department or hospitalized in the last 18 months. So look at these two columns, the usual care column and the palliative care column. Note that the palliative care is being delivered at home with 24 hour a day telephone coverage, meaningful support for caregiver, addressing social problems like loneliness, social isolation, food insecurity, and finding a means of safely managing pain at home. Um, that's a very high value intervention, but very, very difficult to get, at least in the United States. Um, the left-hand column is the standard of care, unfortunately, um, in many countries. So when you think about, remember I said that the costliest 5%, actually 5.7% of patients account for 50% of all spending. Imagine to yourself, if you had to guess, what percentage of that costliest group are in the last year of life? Um, and when I'm speaking to clinical audiences, they often guess it's 80 to 90% of the costliest patients are in the last year of life. In fact, the number is only 11%. So one out of 10 of the costliest patients are in the last year of life. The great majority are not dying or at least are not dying predictably, at least not within a year. About half have short-term high costs. That might be a patient who needs a total hip replacement or coronary artery bypass grafting, or who is admitted for community-acquired pneumonia, but then recovers and re their health returns to baseline. So that accounts for half of the costliest group. But the remainder, the remaining 40%, are people like Mr. C, who have persistent high spending but are not dying. The reason they have persistent high spending is because they end up having to manage chronic medical problems like arthritis by using the emergency department and hospital because there's no safety net, no ability to meet their needs in the community. So by default, they end up in the most expensive setting, the hospital and the emergency department, not because they need to be there, but because there's no alternative. So who are these high need, high cost patients? They are patients who are functionally impaired and need another person to get through the day. Many are frail. Many are cognitively impaired and have some form of dementia. Most, if not all, have exhausted and overwhelmed family caregivers like Mrs. C, um, who can't handle yet another symptom crisis and end up uh, going to the emergency department just to get some help. Um, many have social and behavioral health challenges, poverty, lack of transportation, uh, literacy problems, access to food problems, understanding medications problems, so social and behavioral health challenges. And some have a serious medical illness, but many do not. Many do not have cancer, heart failure, COPD, end-stage renal disease. You don't need one of those diagnoses to fall into one of these high-need, high-cost groups. Um, and when we search for uh, high-risk patients by looking for diagnoses, we miss this much larger group with functional in, in, uh, impairment, frailty, dementia, caregiver stress, um, because we're only looking for specific medical diagnoses. So what is palliative care? Um, just to be sure we're all on the same page with the definition, it is specialized care for people living with a serious medical illness and their family. It is focused on improving quality of life by addressing pain, 
other symptoms and the multiple stresses of living with a serious illness. It's usually provided by a team, a team of doctors, nurses, social workers, spiritual care professionals, and others that works with patients, families, and all the other healthcare professionals to provide an added layer of support. It is delivered to a person of any age, infants, children, teenagers, young adults, older people, any diagnosis at any stage in a serious illness and is provided at the same time as treatments meant to modify or treat disease. So it isn't this model where we do life prolonging care until one day we decide to go to hospice, which is focused solely on the care of the dying, but instead this model where we deliver both life prolonging care and palliative care at the same time for the great majority of time living with a serious illness. So you can imagine a person like Mr. C who continues to need treatment for his hypertension, his renal insufficiency, um, and at the same time needs palliative care focused on support for his quality of life and his function and support for his wife, his caregiver. And really, this is a more accurate image because of the pattern of crisis stability, crisis stability that typically associates is associated with people with chronic disease um, and aging. So just to make sure everyone knows that that these there are many different terms in the literature that um, are used in place of the term palliative care, advanced illness management, advanced care, supportive care, serious illness care, they are all the same thing. So don't let the language variation confuse you. And so um, I think this is true in most developed nations that we have lots increasing access to hospital palliative care on the left. So at the point of an acute hospitalization or crisis, we have access to palliative care. For people who are clearly dying, clearly at the end of life and predictably dying, we have hospice. But we have this big gap in the middle, access to community-based palliative care delivered in doctor's offices, at patients' homes, and in nursing facilities. And Mr. C, through luck, because we happen to have a house calls practice, had access to community-based palliative care. Most patients in most parts of the world do not. And what we know is that there's lots of data on the impact of palliative care on quality of life and quality of care. And you can see all the different outcomes that are measurably improved through receipt of palliative care, including survival, which is better in patients who get palliative care than those who don't. Um, and as a consequence of improving all these outcomes on the left here, costs go way down. Why? Because patients don't end up in the emergency department and don't end up in the hospital. And those are the highest cost settings, obviously. Um, so you end up reducing costs, not by denying needed care, but in fact, by providing the appropriate care in the appropriate setting, you end up not relying on hospitals to manage chronic conditions. So why should health systems and payers care about this? First, we already talked about the concentration of risk and spending in the subset, small subset of patients with functional and cognitive impairment, frail and frailty, with or without a serious illness. Good evidence that palliative care improves quality and reduces cost for this subset. And this is one of the few strategies that do both reliably. How does it actually work? It requires that these six characteristics are present in order to get the improved outcomes of better quality and lower cost. First, you have to have adequately staffed, and by adequately staffed, I mean able to provide reliable coverage at night and on weekends, adequately staffed and educated, trained teams in the relevant settings. It's not good enough to have a palliative care team in the hospital when the patient is having a pain crisis at home. So you have to have palliative care availability where the patients are. 
Um, second, we need to screen for and then target the highest risk people. Third, we need to ask people what matters most to them. Um, most people, not all, most people say they want to stay home. They don't want to be in the hospital, particularly those that have experienced being in the hospital. Um, they want to reduce burden on their family, and they don't want pain um, and other sources of symptom distress. But until you know what's most important to the patient, it's very hard to develop a care plan that honors those priorities. Fourth, it is critical to assess and support family and other caregivers. If they are not supported, the patient will end up using uh, the emergency department and hospital to manage um, crises. Your team has to be well-trained in pain and symptom management. When I uh, made a decision to prescribe very low-dose morphine for Mr. C, it turned out I was the first physician among all those prior emergency department visits and those three prior inpatient hospital stays, who was confident and well-trained enough to safely use morphine in an 88-year-old frail patient with dementia. No one else had the training or the expertise to do so. And the result was a much more dangerous care plan, including hospitalization, that nearly killed him with urosepsis. So it is critical that the teams caring for these patients know what they're doing and are well-trained in safe and effective pain and symptom management. We already talked about the 24-7 access in all settings. Um, and you know, just again, to make the point, 24-7 access is essential in the home and nursing facility. Otherwise, after hours problems end up in the emergency department and hospital. The screening criteria are here. Um, diagnoses are less helpful for identifying the target population than these six characteristics. Functional impairment, frailty, caregiver burden, cognitive impairment, symptom distress and depression anxiety. If we could come up with an algorithm that identifies these factors, we would much more effectively identify the high need, high cost population. In terms of goal setting, the question is to ask the person, the patient and their family, what is most important to you at this stage in your life? Um, and this was an interesting study done in Connecticut in the United States a few years ago with um, older adults who were members of a senior center. Some of them were also living in assisted living facilities. And they were asked to rank order what was most important to them between three priorities. One, living longer. Two, relief from pain and other symptoms. And three, remaining independent. And think to yourself, what do you think came in first of those three priorities for these 357 seniors? By far, the most important priority was remaining independent. Three quarters of these seniors ranked it as most important. Pain and symptom relief came in second as a key priority and staying alive longer was third, was last after these other two. And yet our healthcare system is entirely designed to accomplish the reverse, to accomplish prolonging life as long as possible with very little attention to the first two priorities. Once we know what's most important, how do we then develop and honor a care plan that is aligned with those priorities? Most, but not all, people want to stay home. To stay home requires meaningful 24-7 access to clinicians with palliative care expertise and prescribing capacity. So in the United States, RNs cannot prescribe. Nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and physicians can prescribe. So it is critical to have people on the team who are not only trained, but have prescribing capacity. Supporting families and caregivers, family exhaustion, loneliness is a top reason for return to the hospital. That's why it's critical to assess using 
validated instruments, family caregiver burden, and then mobilize supports for those family caregivers, volunteers, paid aides, engaging other family and friends, scheduling breaks and respite care, provision of transportation, and 24-7 phone access to help. Um, this is how we support caregivers. Families need help at home with pain and symptoms. Mr. C's problem is not unusual, but typical. In this study um, of over 4,000 community dwelling older adults, 46% reported pain of moderate or greater severity that is often troubling and was worst among those with arthritis. So disabling arthritis pain, not cancer, not fractures, but arthritis pain is a major cause of suffering and use of the emergency department and hospital. Families will use the emergency department and hospital if their loved one is in distress and they can't reach help within 30 minutes. What would you do if you had a family member um, in distress and you called the doctor's office and you didn't get a call back? You would go to the emergency department because you can't watch your loved one suffer. So clinicians must be trained and competent in the management of pain and other sources of distress and in the safe and effective use of opioids. We've already talked about the importance of 24 seven access in all settings. What do people do at 2.30 in the morning um, in a pain crisis? If they have no alternative, they will go to the emergency department. It's also really important to talk to people about what to expect because actually it reduces fear and anxiety. And I'm going to describe a patient that I took care of um, a few years ago. Um, this is an article called, I Don't Want Jenny to Think I'm Abandoning Her. It was published in Health Affairs in 2013. Um, and this is what an oncologist said to me when I asked him what he was hoping we could accomplish by giving intrathecal directly into the brain chemotherapy for a patient with brain metastases from lung cancer. Uh, in asking him, because I didn't know, I'm not an oncologist, why he had recommended intrathecal chemotherapy and what he hoped it would do for our patient, this is what he said. I don't want Jenny to think I'm abandoning her. This is Jenny, um, a 55-year-old uh, who lived a good six years with metastatic non-small cell lung cancer thanks to the expert care of her oncologist. Um, but as her disease progressed, uh, and she was seeing both me for palliative care and the oncologist for her cancer treatment for about two years, Towards, towards the end of her life, she was having more difficulty. She was a, a psychologist and psychotherapist. She was having more difficulty staying focused and attentive to her patients. And she went to see the oncologist because, and it turned out her brain mets were expanding and she had already had all the radiation that she could have. And she was already on high dose steroids and she had had many, many uh, different lines of chemotherapy. So she went to see him and he offered intrathecal chemotherapy. Um, and uh, Jenny went home and she called me in my office and asked me, what did I think? Did I think she should do this? And I told her I would call the oncologist and find out what he hoped we could accomplish. And I did call him and and I told him that I, I didn't have much experience with this procedure and asked him, what are you hoping we can accomplish with it? And he immediately responded, it won't help her. And then I had to kind of struggle to figure out what to say next because he had offered it to her and then he just told me it's not going to help her. So remembering that I'm the consultant and not the primary physician, the oncologist is the primary physician, I asked him if he wanted me to encourage her to go ahead with it anyway, even though he had just said it wasn't going to help her. And then there was quite a long pause on the, on the phone. Um, and he said, I don't want Jenny to think I'm abandoning her. And I realized at that moment that so much of what gets done that doesn't make sense 
treatments that don't improve quality of life, that actually increase suffering, um, that do not restore patients to health. Why, why there is so much of that in uh, developed countries uh, and healthcare systems? And it really does have to do with the physician's love for the patient and commitment to the patient and fear that if we are not doing something that it's tantamount to abandonment and an inability to recognize that the relationship with the patient is the important is the important expression of non-abandonment and of love for the patient so my conclusion to this was that this, this was an excellent oncologist. What was the problem? Why was he offering a futile treatment? The problem was his lack of training. He had not been trained with continuing to walk and care for patients once they were no longer benefiting from his treatments. So he felt that if he couldn't offer a treatment, by, by definition, he had to then abandon the patient. He had not been trained to stand by and stick with his patients, whether or not he had a particular treatment to offer or not. So I came to the conclusion that the only solution here is to train. Um, that's a challenge, but um, the organization I work for, the Center to Advance Palliative Care, is 100% committed to redressing the gaps in training that clinicians of all disciplines and of all levels of training have. We just didn't get this training when we were in school and residency. This is Jenny and her husband, George, and their daughter, Sarah, um, on one of the many trips they were able to make, um, thanks to the great care she got from her oncologist. And this is uh, Jenny about a week before she died. I took this picture at home after uh, the oncologist said, I don't want Jenny to think I'm abandoning her. And there was this pause, and he realized the, why he was offering intrathecal chemotherapy and that it didn't make any sense. And he said, we're not going to do that. It's time for Jenny to be referred to hospice. And he did refer her to hospice, and I continued taking care of her at home um, for her palliative care needs. And this was a visit I made about a week before she died. And after I assessed her, um, I asked her a question I often ask patients at this stage of life, which was, how are you feeling inside yourself? Um, many of my patients respond that they're talking to God or that they are talking to ancestors who went before. Jenny responded that, and I thought she was going to tell me she was thinking about her mother from whom she was estranged and that I had this hope that maybe we could heal that relationship before she died. Um, but no, that's not what she was thinking about. She was thinking about her doctor, her oncologist. She said, my oncologist has not called me or been to see me since I've been home on hospice. I thought he really cared about me. So the oncologist did exactly what he didn't want to do, which was abandon her, because he didn't know how to stay in relationship with her once he no longer had treatments to offer. Um, with her permission, I called the oncologist when I got back to my office after this visit and said to him um, that Jenny would really like to see you. And he responded back, why? There's nothing I can do for her. Isn't she home on hospice? And I said, she, she's very fond of you and very grateful to you. And she wants to say thank you. And she wants to say goodbye. And he actually went and made his first home visit. And they, she did say thank you. And she did say goodbye. And he said the same. And I next saw him at her funeral a few days later. And he now leads the cancer center at the medical center where Jenny was receiving care, and he has two fully staffed palliative care teams in his cancer center now, all thanks to Jenny um, and what, what she taught him, what she taught me, and what she has taught many, many others, um, because I have her and her family's permission to use their story. And I'll close with this quote from Albert Einstein writing in 1935, In the World as I See It. 
Every day I remind myself that my inner and outer life are based on the labors of other men and women, living and dead, and that I must exert myself in order to give in the same measure as I have received and am still receiving. Thank you so much for your attention. Just want to show you some resources. Um, there are extensive clinical training resources on our website. You can see the um, URL at the bottom of the slide. And these are just some of the examples of um, the modules that are available, pain management, chronic pain strategies, best practices in dementia care and caregiver support, and so on. Um, and um, there are also courses on how to set up successful community-based palliative care programs. So if you're trying to create a home-based palliative care program design, such as the one, like the one Mr. C is benefiting from, or in a nursing facility, there is extensive resources, tools, training, and technical assistance also available on our website. So that is the end of my remarks, and we will move on to a brief question and answer session now. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. We hope you have put in your questions because we are honored to have Dr. Diane Meyer live with us now to address your questions. Hi, good morning, Dr. Meyer. Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning in Singapore. So glad to be here. Okay, our enthusiastic audience have prepared some questions for you. Are you ready to take on the first one? I am. Okay, so the first question is, Hi, Dr. Maya. Can I find out more about the home house call team? Who are the members of the team? What is the model of care? And is the entire team palliative care trained? The model of care is a predominantly advanced practice nurse, nurse, what we call nurse practitioner in the United States. But they, the nurse practitioner is supported by a social worker and by physicians. So if the nurse practitioner wants a physician to come to the house, a physician will come. Otherwise, he or she will discuss the patient with the physician. All patients are discussed once a week in a team meeting. Um, and we also train medical residents and medical students. So they go out to make the home visits with the nurse practitioner. So that's the model of care. When a patient is accepted into the house calls program, that becomes their primary care doctor, their primary care practice. So that team is managing everything, hypertension, diabetes, getting vaccines done, getting lab tests if they're necessary. They're functioning as if they were the primary care doctor, but they are also delivering palliative care at the same time. They are not palliative care specialists, but they've been mostly trained using CAPC resources, the courses that I showed you. Um, and then some of their attending physicians have done a palliative medicine fellowship, but not all. Most of them have just come straight out of internal medicine residency training. Thank you, Dr. Meyer. The next question, how do we finance healthcare in such a way that acute care is not perversely incentivized, especially for frail elders who are near the end of life? Well, that is a political question and a policy question. Um, it's quite clear that 
using the acute care hospital to manage the chronic medical illnesses of older adults is irrational because these are not acute problems, they are chronic problems. And the acute care hospital is not the right place to manage chronic problems. It's a very expensive, dangerous, and inappropriate place to manage chronic problems, but it's the only thing we have. So that's where patients end up. Um, it's, it will require shifting resources out and shifting resources to where the patients need them, which is in nursing facilities for those patients who are in nursing home type settings, but most importantly to people's homes to support family caregivers and to support patients in their own homes, which is where the great majority wish to be. They feel they are in fact safer there, safer from the risk of infection and other hospital complications, um, safer being around a place and people that they know and recognize. Um, and there's no reason why we can't provide medical care in that setting. There's absolutely no barrier other than the will to do so. Thank you. Okay, our third and final question for Dr. Meyer. Thank you for the amazing talk. What proportion of the high care cost groups were frail? What frailty assessment tools do you use? Oh my, um, there are a bunch of different frailty scales that, that we use and I can't off the top of my head I identify them, but basically the simplest and the fastest are the ones that we use, nothing that requires a lot of time and effort. Um, there's five, five stages or levels of frailty and um, that can be assigned by the nurse who does the vital signs when the patient comes into clinic or um, when the patient is seen at home, but, but frailty as the questioner is identifying, is, is a major predictor of risk. Um, risk of further decline, risk of mortality, risk of complications like falls. Um, so very important to identify it because it identifies a much higher risk population that needs more hovering and protection and support. Sorry, Dr. Meyer, do you have time for one more final question? There's overwhelming response here. I'd be very happy to answer as many questions as you have time for. Okay, great. Okay, so the last question, how can general practitioners or primary health care providers play an active role in palliative care? That's a great question. Um, and I think... It should be obvious to everyone that there will never be enough palliative care specialists to meet the needs of an aging and chronically ill population. And that in fact, it must be the responsibility of all clinicians, especially primary care clinicians, but also specialists like surgeons or oncologists or cardiologists to learn the foundational principles of palliative care and to bring those principles and practices to the care of all of our patients. That is the reason why the Center to Advance Palliative Care has invested millions of dollars in creating an online training curriculum that is easily accessible to clinicians all over the world. Um, and in fact, our curriculum is being used by clinicians all over the world. Um, the goal is to make it easy and effective to learn this content that most of us never got when we were in nursing school or medical school, just wasn't included in the curriculum. So we can't just say, well, I never got trained in doing it, so I guess I can't do it. We have to get the training, and that's why we built the curriculum, and um, we'd be delighted to facilitate its use in Singapore as well. Thank you so much, Dr. Meyer, 
for spending time with us this morning. I think the crowd here in person and on Zoom has really enjoyed your sharing. So let us thank Dr. Meyer. Thank you so much. Thank you very much yep. Take for good care. inviting me. Good luck with the rest of the conference. Thank you. We'll now proceed to the second keynote lecture, and we are delighted to have with us Dr. Angel Lee, Dr. Karen Liao from the St. Andrews Community Hospital. They will be sharing with us the insightful takeaways from the VIOLET program, which is a new model of palliative care that focuses on the care of non-cancer seniors in the community. Am I supposed to stay at a certain spot? Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, good morning, friends and colleagues. Um, uh, it's a real honor to be here and to be invited to share the stage with uh, Dr. Meyer. Um, after hearing what she has to say, I, I wonder what, we are, what else we could add to the rich uh, teaching that she has already delivered. Uh, Karen nudged me just now as I was sitting there, and I'm sure she was thinking about the same thing. We could easily have given her the rest of our 45 minutes to answer the long list of questions that are already there. But nevertheless, it's my privilege to be here, and I want to thank uh, Christina and uh, uh, Wai Chong for the invitation. If I had known that I'd be sharing the stage with Dai Maya, I would have thought twice about accepting it. <laughs> uh, after so many years, um, I. I still feel that there's so much I do not know. And I'm also looking forward to hearing from Wai, Sylvia, and Han Yi and then the rest, uh, if, uh, in the rest of the symposium. Uh, I've been asked to share about the Violet program. Uh, and for those of you who do not know, this is a home and nursing home palliative program named after our ward in St. Andrews Community Hospital. In St. Andrews, all our wards are named after flowers. And, and Sean tells me that the violet flower blooms at the end of the day. And I've also read that the violet hours are the time of the day towards the, the evening when the sun sets and the sky is a violet hue. So this is of rich significance to us uh, as we develop the program. And I tell the team the acronym reminds us of why we are doing this and the honor and the respect we need to give our patients in this VIP program. Um, before I start, I just want to acknowledge the team behind this work. Obviously, it's not uh, the work of just ourselves alone. We work very closely for home nursing colleagues. Uh, we cannot get the whole medical team in as we took this picture. Uh, but as, and as Karen will share with you uh, later on, the home admin team actually has to do a lot of work to make it work. Uh, I also like to acknowledge uh, the work of Ivan. Uh, Ivan helped us to crunch a lot of data you know, so that we could make this presentation today. And of course, Sing Health and uh, Tomasic Foundation for the support they have given us in the evaluation of this piece of work. So after hearing uh, Prof Meyer's talk, I, I wonder whether I can ask you to humor me and also those online by firstly closing your eyes. Everybody close your eyes. Okay, close your eyes. Okay. Now, can you imagine your future self as you reach the end of your life? Okay, just imagine your future self. And after Prof. Meyer's talk, where do you think you will be? What do you think you'll be suffering from? Who do you think will be looking after you? Who will be beside you even as you reach the end of your life? Okay, open your eyes. <laughs> so today we hope to share with you what we know, uh, what we actually hope to achieve when we started this Violet program. 
And uh, uh, what I'm to share, you probably have heard a lot of it. That's the easy part. Uh, Karen is going to do the difficult part, <laughs> right? uh, what we have learned. And uh, I'll close again with some concluding remarks. So what do we know? Now, you have, I hope, in your mind, an image of your future self as you reach the end of life. And you're right. You will die old. <laughs> if you reach 60 years old, which is very likely you will, okay, you have about 25 and a half years more to live. Singapore, as you know, has one of the highest life expectancy. But the bad news is, you have another about five and a half years is disability. Some people say that dying takes longer in the new world. Okay, I'm conflating frailty and disability. I know there are geriatricians in the audience. Okay, so just to say that all right, I know my I know that different entities, disability and frailty is not the same, okay, but they're often used to identify vulnerable adults. Are you like what uh, our senior parliamentary uh, uh, secretary has said early on? Most normal adults, when surveyed, actually thought and wish they're at home, right? And this result has been rather consistent in a repeat study by SMU, again mentioned earlier on, most people would like to be at home. But if we carry on what we are doing now, you will very likely end up in a hospital in your last days. And because of the way our population is shifting, many of you may actually be in nursing homes. And the minister had already said last month, they are gearing up to almost double the nursing home beds um, by 2030. And I'm glad that to say that uh, even as we plan this program, we uh, to ensure that we also cover our nursing homes. And as we say, if you've got questions, Sean is sitting down there. He is the lead of our nursing home programs. And the, Madam, Mr. C's family that was mentioned earlier by Diane Meyer okay, has significant caregiver stress. When I came in, I don't see many frail people amongst the audience. Okay, but you're, when you consider if you are fortunate enough to be at home near the end of life, it is quite likely that if you're family members have already busy schedules and they are suffering from already a very stressful life with possibly having to cope with many things, there is a higher chance that they would actually be more stressed. And let's face it, we tend to work in silos, right? Characterized by handoffs and transfer of care as we, as we jump between settings. And these are constrained by lines of communication, funding, as well as governance. Who will be looking after you? Who is currently looking after many of these frail seniors who are homebound? I will list four groups of people. The first group is nobody. Right? And that's why you end up repeatedly in hospital. There's nobody in charge of your care. And of the other three groups, it's probably a mixture between the GPs, the home medical services, the home care teams, as well as home hospice teams. So AIC tells me, right, Loman gave me this data, right, that says that there are about 70 plus home care providers, you know, and they serve this number of people, and there are currently 24 home medical teams providing subsidized care. And these home medical services are serviced by in-house or locum doctors. They're generally part of a multidisciplinary team working with home nursing, home therapy, home personal teams. They have access to funding for subsidized equipment. But funding is piecemeal, meaning that you get home nursing, you get funding for home nursing, you, you have home medical, you have funding for home medical, etc., etc. And it is office hour support. If you are fortunate enough, you get referred to a home hospice team. And these groups tend to be multidisciplinary with the core doctor, nurse, social worker, and very often 
There are other team members, and they're supported by volunteers. You, 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 many home hospice teams actually have access to equipment we can lend you at short notice. They may also have access to the funding in, if in the event that your prognosis is a bit longer and you would like to purchase equipment. They have access to funding for respite care and most services currently are free, right? supported by charity. Singapore Hospice Council has done uh, some collection of data. Though not all uh, services are covered, roughly about close to 6,000 people right, are cared for home hospice providers every year. Right? Considering the number of deaths per year, it is roughly still less than about 30% of people who are passing on may have access to home hospice providers. And unfortunately, most of you will not die of cancer. Okay. We have done this survey many times amongst healthcare workers, and many of them, when asked, what would you like to die of? What do they choose? Cancer. They prefer to die of cancer. <laughs> Why? Because the services are, are designed around cancer care. It's what we call an aware death. You know that time is coming and you prepare for it. So many in the know okay, would choose to die of cancer. But the sad fact is that many of us will not die of cancer. <laughs> All right. In the States, you see a very nice distribution whereby the referrals, of the, those who die uh, are actually evenly distributed, meaning that 70% of home of, of, of decedents all right, are actually non-cancer. It's a reverse in Singapore. All right? Only about only less than a third of our home hospice teams are currently serving patients with non-cancer. Okay. So what did we hope to achieve when we set up the Violet program? Firstly, a bit about St. Andrew's uh, home care team. Compared to the giant of HNF, we had a very tiny service. Okay? Uh, we served the east of Singapore, uh, some obligation in Henderson and Queenstown. We only have about 300 patients, not like your thousands that the whole HNF have. And if you look at it, majority of our patients actually are severely frail or above. About a third of them pass on every year. And the mean age, a median age is 81.3 years. When we started the Violet program, we have aspirations to meet the non-cancer uh, patients, uh, to work in partnerships with Changi Hospital, as well as our home medical team, our home care team, in providing shared care and uh, trying to break away from the silos we just mentioned, and also try to address the frail seniors in nursing home. And in that regard, our uh, home care service, our home health service, actually supports the Eagle Care program as well as St. Andrew's nursing home. And we had, at that time, aspirations to layer upon community nursing. Mm. And in so doing, we hope to see the more complex patients to also serve as a rapid response team. Remember, many of patients are frail. And if they turn ill, we were hoping that we can also be the rapid response team for the uh, home medical uh, colleagues. Uh, it's multidisciplinary, and we were trying very hard to try and make the financial uh, support as seamless as possible. So this is, a more, this is a trajectory that many of you are familiar with as the patient dips in the non-cancer population. And we're hoping to be able to support when the complexity rises and for the home medical team and uh, the community nurses to be the anchor provider, uh, uh, care uh, provider when the patient's uh, uh, condition is not as complex. And we did hope Right, when we start the program, that with training, like what Diane Meyer said, that with training, this bar can go up. What has been the results been? It's been less than two years since our program started. And the truth of the matter is that actually our patients have multiple comorbidities, multiple. But if you have to put down one okay, as the main one, okay, this is what it looks like. Right? Dementia, renal failure, heart failure, just frailty, don't know which is the main one, okay? COPD, etc. Okay. Uh, we had uh, about two thirds of patients being discharged, and you can guess, yes, they discharged through death, right? 92% have been discharged through death. We are trying to discharge in that sense uh, some patients to our home care gradually, even though we are layering upon it, and we'll share that later on, some are discharged to our hospice 
team before they pass on. But many of them, you know, uh, do, I mean, some of them die before discharge with us in our uh, a violet ward in St. Andrews. But the majority, we are glad to say, had managed to pass on at home. And currently, I would say that the uh, average num uh, percentage for home hospice teams is about 60 to 80 percent. Uh, I, I read the uh, uh, Christina's, you know, your integrated uh, palliative program, right? Um, you're already managing 40 percent dying at home right now. Mm -hmm. We have found that, yes, majority of our patients have a, a high means testing, meaning they have a low income. A quarter of them will require some form of palliative equipment. This includes syringe drivers and pumps, as well as oxygen uh, uh, concentrators and sometimes hospital beds. Right? And uh, up almost a third right, still require home nursing procedures. Mm. What are some of the lessons learned? And here, I'm going to pass the time to Karen, uh, who is going to share with you some preliminary findings we have uh, from this uh, program. And, and, and these are not too dissimilar from what uh, uh, Diane Meyer has already shared. You need to see. Unlike my boss, um, who has 20 uh, plus years of uh, experience uh, giving uh, talks, um, the young one here is the restroom, my speech, and this mic. Okay. So, now, uh, what are some of the lessons that we have learned? Okay. All right. Most of the data uh, that I'm showing you today uh, are actually data from our various sources, uh, namely our VIP database, our patient registry, some staff surveys that we did, um, and preliminary findings uh, from our program evaluation. Okay. Uh, so VIP actually uses the PCOC. Uh, palliative Care Outcomes Collaboration, which is a suite of tools to assess symptoms uh, from both the patient as well as the clinician's perspectives, uh, and also to assess the patient's functional status. Now, this graph uh, shows the symptom distress on initial assessment. And the symptom distress uh, should be scored as much as possible uh, by the patient or by the family caregiver who's familiar with the patient. And surprisingly, the most distressing symptom um, is actually constipation in some 40% of the patients. And these are patients largely have not been started on opioids yet. And about a quarter of the, the patients have at least moderate distress from breathlessness and pain. So it is actually very important uh, for the service to ensure that opioids are readily available for urgent use in symptom management within the safeguards of a controlled drug policy that balances both patient needs as well as compliance to the national regulations on opioid use. And as the, Dr. Angel mentioned, uh, equipment loan is also very useful to assist distressed patients and families to manage practical needs. Now, this next slide, uh, we actually see the problem severity as rated by the clinician on the first visit, uh, on the first home visit as well. And if you look at it, the family and caregiver issues were actually found to be much more challenging uh, than patient. And issues include carer stress, high family anxiety uh, and availability of competent carers, all of this impacting on the patient care at home. And this ties in with the high caregiver burden scored in about half of the first ZBI surveys that were returned uh, by the informal caregivers. And also of note, the symptoms that are other than pain were actually reported to be an issue of mild to moderate severity in about 15% of patients, which is actually higher uh, than pain being an issue. And most of the time, symptoms often cited were secretions, breathlessness, and behavioral issues related to uh, advanced dementia. 
And this reflects the situation on the ground, where family and caregiver-related issues are really considerably more challenging to resolve than patient symptoms. And good medical social work support in a, multiple, a multidisciplinary home care team really value adds uh, from this point of view. Now, we surveyed our nurses, we asked them for their top three challenges in managing our VIP symptoms, our VIP patients. In this table, the home palliative nurses are the specialist nurses who only manage VIP patients, while the home nursing nurses are what we consider as the generalist nurses, managing both stable VIP patients as well as the usual home nursing patients for procedures. So if you look at the table again, family and caregiver issues was ranked the highest by both group of nurses. And challenging family caregiver issues listed included managing very anxious family who may not have been prepared to care for patients at the end of life, or even accept that patient is actually at the end of life. And among common, another common cause uh, for caregiver anxiety is actually feeding. Food refusal, dysphagia, significant aspiration risk, drowsiness, secretions, and conflicting opinions between the family as well as the care team. There are some families who request for very, very frequent home visits to review patients, some caregivers who may have a bit more fixated ideas uh, about things that may not align with the uh, goals of care, and hence do not follow instructions given by the team. And some have rather demanding um, in terms of information that they want, the time and the expectations. And all this cause challenges in communications and strain in the relationship between the family and the service provider. Refractory symptoms was ranked second by both groups of nurses. And in specialist nurses, they actually felt complex nursing procedures were a challenge. Now, this refers to the care of complex wounds, sometimes difficult feeding tube or IDC insertions. Now, the level of difficulty for specialist nurses is likely to differ from that of the journalist nurses whose skills is honed by the frequency that they actually perform uh, the procedure. And similarly, where prognostication may not be as challenging an issue for the specialist nurses, the generalist nurses struggle with it, um, with the estimated time as some of the patients actually outlive their prognosis, where else some they felt died way too soon than they expected. So it's actually very important in recognizing the strengths of each group of nurses and actually having clarity of their roles in the management of the different types of patients. And this will actually help build a team that contributes to a seamless patient care and potentially even reducing the stress that is faced by the staff. Now, challenges, uh, challenges in provision of care from the administrative front. Now, challenges um, mainly result from our attempts to actually improve the patient and family's experience of the healthcare system. There's significant operational work that is required to enable access to variable claim, uh, various claims, for example, MediSafe, MediFund, disability schemes. Access to all this does not begin and end with just an approval. It starts from identifying then screening, applying, assessing, processing, approving or rejecting, and renewing. And while doing all this, we need to manage the family expectations, the communications between various departments and team members, or sometimes even uh, different service providers, making sure that the documentation meets requirements of governing agencies, juggling between the various systems needed to oper operationalize the flow, and the list goes on. And at present, the home palliative patients are able to tap onto MediSafe uh, for payment of the home palliative bills, but not home medical or home nursing. And this is significant because patients who eventually stabilize and may no longer require home palliative care, 
they need to be discharged to Hope Medical, where they will be required to fork out cash payment and actually no longer benefit to 24-7 care. And to add to this distress, patients and families are subject to different criteria for financial assistance in different sectors of healthcare. And then there's this confusion of uh, eligible to Medifund and Medisafe only in a particular institution because the approval is approval and consent for a specific organization. And then you have the administrative operational hurdles in subvention claims as patients transit between VIP and home medical service according to their needs. Okay, my boss said don't spend so much time talking about administrative challenges, so I must move on. <laughs> okay, now the role of ACP. Palliative and end-of-life care has almost become synonymous with ACP. In only about 15.6% of VIP admissions have a known ACP. And this rather low evidence of an end-of-life discussion correlates with the ground experience that we have when calling families to introduce VIP service and its roles. Now, it can very, be very challenging when families hear over the phone about end-of-life care for the first time by a person that they have never even met before. All right. So there have been incidences where we had to get the referring team to say, oh, can you please speak to this family and explain to them the reason for the referral because they have no idea, before we can actually call them back and follow up on the program introduction. Now, ACP is actually a very good tool to start an end-of-life conversation because it checks the family and uh, patient's understanding on illnesses and the understanding of the patient's values and preferences. By starting these conversations further upstream, it allows more time for a more coherent discussion and provides patients themselves an opportunity to participate in the discussion. As high as 84.6% of completed ACPs in VIP did not involve patients because of lack of mental capacity. And early ACP discussions are also uh, also helped to create a gentler opening palliative service introduction downstream. Early conversations also need to be complemented with good documentation that can be followed through at various time points and AI, uh, AIC ACP portal for uploaded ACPs is a source of reference across organisations who do not share the same IT system, ensuring that conversations are not lost and also reduces the patient and family frustrations when similar conversations are repeated time and again without reference to an earlier conversation. Most importantly, ACPs are ongoing discussions. The form is just a documentation of the most recent discussion. Preferences can change over time as patients go through different life experiences not only healthcare experiences. So a change in preference is by no means a failure in the ACP. Now, prognostication has always been a challenge, even by disease-specific uh, specialists. So this data comes from our patient registry. Referrals that come our way, uh, non-urgent, urgent, and terminal discharges, then dictates uh, the contact time. And on retrospective uh, view, review of the data, it shows that urgent referrals, which have a length of service of 32.4 days, nearly 60% of them had a length of service of less than seven days. And this is accounted for by the large range. So you have zero LOS to 449 days of LOS. Um, expected referral time for contact uh, to, for urgent referrals is 48 hours or less. Uh, referring to either a phone contact or physical contact. So far, VIP's average referral to first home visit for urgent referrals has been one day. Um, but that is still possible because the service is a small service. Um, terminal discharges require a referral to contact time of less than 24 hours. And the mean LOS so far has been about 8 to 8.8 .8 days, with one outlier who was like 85 days. Although the sample service is actually uh, the sample size is actually rather small, but the numbers do reflect the challenges uh, with accurate prognostication. 
Now we look at the resource utilization in the last eight weeks before discharge. Sorry, there's a typo um, in the slide. It's last eight weeks before discharge rather than uh, last weeks of life. Um, but at the same time, um, many of our discharges are actually death discharges. So resource utilization is looking at only physical and video consults consisting of at least one or maybe two or more a doctor, nurse or social worker in any combination. And it does not include phone calls and text messages, which is very common touch point uh, with families. So 21 days was used as the cutoff to distinguish between a short and a longer LOS as the median LOS was about 18 days. So this graph provides a longitudinal view with a shorter LOS. The number of touch points in the last week before discharge is just over about 1.5, higher than the patients with a longer LOS, uh, which is just over one touch point. Now here we see the same data again, represented in terms of percentages. Uh, again, it's the last week before discharge from VIP, and in patients with an LOS of less than 21 days, about 40% of them require one or more touch points uh, in the last week before discharge, as compared to 35% in patients with a longer LOS. And the final graph uh, about resource utilization, um, patients with an LOS of less than 21 days, 22% of them had more than two touch points in the last week before discharge, more than 10% higher than the patients with a longer LOS. So we therefore hypothesize that patients with a shorter LOS actually requires higher resource utilization in the last weeks prior to discharge compared with patients who have been in the program much further upstream uh, of their patient journey. And we think that the patients who have had longer LOS are likely to be more accepting, probably a bit more primed uh, to end-of-life care, and they've already built this relationship with the team such that appropriate and personalised anticipatory care has been provided. For example, management of symptoms, normalisation of the dying process, some after-death practical instructions and arrangements, resulting in the families feeling more support, reducing uh, anxiety. And when we looked at only death discharges, the group as a whole, 85% of the patients required more than one touch point in the last week of life, 25% of them more than three touch points in the last week of life and the range was between zero to six touch points in the last week of life. Now, very quickly, um, care integration. We look at interviews from the VIP stakeholders providing care from both the referral point as well as the VIP uh, team themselves. And due to time constraints, I'm just going to four, quickly share four teams, which are alignment in the philosophy of care among the providers, respect for one another, a team needs to be approachable, and lastly, there's a need to be effective and efficient um, communication on patients and providers. Alignment in the philosophy of care provides a good sense of direction and focus, and it also provides that sense of trust that patient needs will be met. So this quote describes about having the same wavelength, the same vocabulary, and the same understanding, which helps making together very much easier uh, between the referral and the receiving team. When there is respect for one another, there is a feeling of camaraderie among the providers, which translates to referring providers feeling a bit more at ease when approaching the VIP team. So the, the respect um, as well as the importance of com efficient communications between providers, which is the fourth uh, team raised. Um, being approachable also plays a role uh, in care integration and effective and efficient communication uh, to uh, address patient and providers' concerns. So right now, there's a lot of phone call, there's a lot of Tiger Connect communication. Um, it also helps that our team sits together with our home care team, sits together with the Changi community team within the same office. So it really helps in the ad hoc case discussion. 
and we also share the same IT system as Changi. Uh, Dr. Ko, the palliative consultant from Changi, is also one of our co-leads. We meet weekly. So all these different pieces have come together to create an ecosystem that enables a seamless handover and continuity of care, um, which are still continuing to work on. Now, lastly, uh, this slide shows the descriptive statistics uh, from our home medical service. We had a total of 119 referrals uh, since December 2020, with 70% successful enrollment. Now, if I were to break it down to a six-month period of the program start, December 2020 till May 2021, 100 referrals from home medical with only 69% successful enrollment. Majority of the referrals were redrawn by families because the patient and family's goals were not aligned uh, with the focus on symptom and management of quality of life, preferring instead for readmissions to hospitals and more invasive management. And if I were to compare that similar six-month period one year later, that is December 2021 to May 2022, there was a significant drop in enrollments to 15 enrollments with 100% successful enrollment. Slightly less than half of our patients are actually categorised as a subgroup which we refer to as shared care. Uh, just to recap what Dr Lee's description earlier, this model where the generalist clinicians continue providing care for these more stable patients with their doctor's visits pre-planned, regular intervals, usually a few months in between, and nursing visits uh, depends on the procedural needs. Not very different from the home medical and uh, home nursing uh, model. So the specialist clinicians then layer upon this to provide the rapid response and the 24-7 cover. And patients transit between full, what we call full VIP, full VIP and shared care back and forth depending on the needs and the care intensity uh, of the patient. Referral criteria is the same as usual VIP. Now, as whole medical team became more familiar with the referring criteria, it then became a double-edged sword because by ensuring referrals were made uh, appropriately, they pre-screened the patients, ensure the patient and family were very, very firm in their decision to remain at home for terminal care. Many of the patients did not fulfill the criteria because the criteria for admission to home hospices include recurrent admissions to the hospital in the last 12 months. And this indirectly penalizes the home medical and the good care at home because these patients don't get admitted in the last 12 months. Even though they are very frail, they can acutely deteriorate at any point in time. Now, so all these are some descriptive statistics, uh, preliminary research findings so far. And I must say that many of my slides contain the word challenge and sometimes may occasionally bother on frustration. Uh, this program is, is still very much a uh, work in progress. Many different permutations we have already thought through, scenarios still happen all the time in clinical management, administrative and operational areas. So challenging to us, the word challenge again, but to put a positive spin to it, it also feeds our passion in trying to provide the best care possible um, for our patients. So I will hand you back to Dr. Lee, uh, who will conclude this sharing. Thank you. Yes, so in conclusion, um, we just want to say that, uh, yes, um, conversation should carry on all the time. Uh, you know, this is what we call parallel planning, all right? And that also helps uh, us when we uh, layer upon the home medical and the home nursing teams. Uh, because of common pathways, yes, get your controlled drugs ready, uh, get your equipment availability ready, and do not estimate, you know, the work in building these networks of care uh, between the restructured healthcare system and us in the community, and between our specialist healthcare providers, uh, ourselves, and our home nursing, home medical colleagues. Uh, Tiger Connect, Tiger Text has revolutionized right, how we connect with um, the, the, the doctors in the hospitals and has made the care much more seamless. Um, we are still struggling the issue about common records. As much as uh, Karen says it's nice to be on the same 
platform, actually you're thinking of getting out of that platform. <laughs> because it's just so clunky, all right? Uh, so low clarity is very important. And um, yeah, I told her, don't speak too much about administrative things, you know, because uh, sometimes you don't know who we are speaking to, okay? Uh, but it is really work in progress. And I see I'm very privileged and very... Um, uh, in a sense, to be part of the change that is now taking place as the minister puts the spotlight on end-of-life care. And I do see the very accelerated pace in which many of these changes are taking place. So it is a very exciting times ahead. And many of the things that we share, uh, I can see solutions ahead. Remember, we said that we wanted to layer care on community nurses, but we found that we couldn't do that, right? Because when they want us to come in, they must step out. Right? And sometimes they don't need to step out. They can work with us and be part of the process. So currently, that was very, this is very difficult. Okay. And so much work is required, and we are still working on it. Actually, when we were sharing, um, and we were preparing these slides, uh, and in fact, uh, up to yesterday night, I was getting a bit concerned that this is becoming a very technical presentation. It's like dying is so operational and so, in some ways, attending to physiological things, right? Get oxygen ready, get control drugs ready. Yeah, but I hope that we do not forget. And as, again, uh, following on to what Prof Maya has said and also what uh, Karen has shared about the challenges that we have, dying is a very relational process. It's a very spiritual experience. And we would be on the losing end if we forget this aspect. And um, I'm not sure just now when you were, I asked you all to humor me by thinking about your future self. Right? What is in that future experience? I'm sure that in that future experience that you think you would be in, there are people around, there's family around. And you have beliefs, and you have rituals that your family hold dear to, and you work within your own religious, cultural context that you have. So it is indeed a very relational experience when we talk about dying. And I just want to say that this is a very precious uh, space that you go into when you want to do this work. It's a very privileged space. Um, just want to share, and I don't know when I have time, that I see the clock never moved. Okay, so, <laughs> so maybe I still have time. It, uh, um, on Tuesday, we had a multidisciplinary round. Um, and Susan, one of our nurses, shared about a, a case that she was looking after. And uh, and just very casually mentioned that, oh, the wife calls her three to four times a day. I said, wow, what does she call you for? Oh, very trivial things. Ask some questions, uh, make some remarks. And I think Karen mentioned, uh, sometimes also quite incoherent. <laughs> so in my very technical mind, I thought, hey, yeah, maybe a uh, beginning of dementia. Uh, so I... I told her, maybe uh, to help you uh, refer to CGH Care Line, okay? <laughs> the volunteers, eh? I mean, not the volunteers, I mean the people who take the course, no, no need to stress you so much. And the other part of my technical brain say, yeah, I must start getting volunteers involved. But then she shared, it's okay. You know, so what happens when she calls you and you're busy? Oh, I just tell her, you know, um, I'm busy now, I'll call you back later. And yeah, I see the time's up sign, so I'm a bit worried. <laughs> yeah, so that she went on to say, hey, Dr. Lee, it's okay. I just tell her, weekend is a con call doctor. Things that are not urgent, please don't call weekend, okay? You can call weekday. <laughs> so really, this family has actually invited her into their space. And this family has made her part of her, their community. And this is precious. And this is a privilege. 
And I'd just like to end by saying that it is also a gift. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Lee and Dr. Liao. I'm so sorry. May I invite Dr. Lee and Dr. Liao back on stage? And we can do two <laughs> Q&A sessions before the much-awaited break. OK. Are you ready? <laughs> wow, these are <all> questions. <laughs> yeah. So um, the first question is actually from me. Okay. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Yeah, so I wanted to check in with Dr. Lee. If we are able to provide extensive caregiver support and training during the office hours, do you think that we can achieve good palliative care even without 24-7 support? Okay, this sounds like an answer that I've given before, but don't know whether it will work or not. Okay. <laughs> I've been asked the question, what, are the, what will make it make, what will make, it make or break? Right, make a big, make, make, make a program like this, and my answer has been that, you know, it depends on the base you start with. If you start with a low base, then anything else is better, right? So if you have no training before, certainly it's you know your training is one step higher already. Well, so what if you cannot afford twenty four seven cover at this point in time, right? Just start training, right? But as time goes on, if you have the luxury, then you should aim to be more comprehensive, right? What you do not want is to go backwards, uh, huh? <laughs> I mean, I hope this answers your questions. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so the final question for Dr. Lee and Dr. Liao is, how available is palliative care in the nursing homes of Singapore? Wow, this one, I see a lot of AIC people. <laughs> Maybe they should answer this question. Uh, I would say that increasingly there are uh, increased uh, um, uh, uh, appreciation of the need uh, for training as well as a systematic change. I think currently, if you ask whether uh, how available it, it is, it can be available because a lot of home hospice teams go in to nursing homes. So you can't say it's not available. And many of the staff themselves have knowledge. But what is required is actually a systematic process of identification, of coverage, of medication availability, of your protocols. I think this is where I think much work is required. Mm. Thank you so much. A warm thank you again to Dr. Lee and Dr. Liao. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, I will not hold you back from the break. We will take a 15 minutes break. For the audience in the auditorium with us, we have prepared some snacks and light refreshments for you to enjoy in the foyer area. Just a gentle reminder that food and drinks are not allowed in this auditorium. So please enjoy a good break. We will see you back at 10.45. Have a good break and networking. Thank you. Thank you for rejoining us after the break. We are halfway into the program for today and we sincerely hope that you are having a wonderful time so far. For now, we will begin our case discussion panel. And with that, I would like to invite Dr. Ng Wai Chong, Medical Advisor to Home Nursing Foundation, and case presenter, Ms. Priscilla Lai, Advanced Practice Nurse at Home Nursing Foundation on the stage, please. Joining us are three subject experts as well. May we invite Dr. Nyo Han Yi, Head and Senior Consultant, Palliative Medicine Department, Tan Tok Seng Hospital. <laughs> Ms. Chi Wai Yi, Senior Director, Grief Matters, Monfort Care. Don't and of course, yeah, Miss Sylvia okay. Lee, Advanced Practice Nurse, Dover Park right. Hospice. Can sit anywhere. Yeah. Please give a warm welcome to our <laughs> subject experts. <laughs> Making a special appearance today is Miss Yap Jinghui. 
She is our H&F staff as well as an experienced caregiver who has an experience of caring for a loved one that is near end of life. Singhui, please. I will now hand over the time to Dr. Ng Wai Chong, who will explain the format of the case discussion and moderate the session. Thank you. Thank you, Shireen. And um, thank you so much for our panel of distinguished speakers. Actually, all of them are, in my opinion, giants you know, in the field of palliative care, and they could well take the rostrum for the keynotes earlier. But we like to, we, we, we curated the content such that it pitches for the policy makers, you know, for people who want to implement program. And here, we like um, the panel to um, teach, uh, to share the experience on actual clinical practices, you know, uh, on the ground. Because in the in the room here, we have a lot of clinicians. So, and how do we want to do this? We we are using two real cases that we encountered. Um, uh, one of them actually caused a lot of distress to our team. So. Um, so with that, we have Priscilla, and these are her, her patients. So Priscilla, could you maybe share with us the two cases? After the case, then I'll invite uh, each of um, the panelists to comment on it. And the audience, you are also welcome to ask questions. If I have time, uh, we will um, answer them as well. Yeah, please. Priscilla. Thank you very much, Dr. Ng. Um, very good morning to everybody, and thank you very much for taking the time to spend with us your morning, and also to all the speakers and our uh, panelists over here. Thank you so much for your time. Um, as Dr. Ng um, explained just now, these are actually real cases that we've handled in Home Nursing Foundation, and I just want to say that I really felt very, very validated just now <laughs> <laughs> listening to all the speakers because this is the experience that we've had with our patients. So, without further ado, case study one. Um, um, we'll go through Madam C. Um, um, Madam C is an 83-year-old female and she was admitted to our home medical home nursing service in May of 2021, from, referred from the restructured hospitals. And um, she had interim care services on board post-discharge. And the service came through requesting for chronic disease management, um, indwelling catheter care as well as wound care. You can have a look at her past medical history. It's the full page, and I've actually edited some of them out because it's too much already. In case of any child. <laughs> yeah, it's typical yeah, patients yes, that we a have. Yes, a very, very yeah. typical patient, actually. So this is the background of her social and environmental setup. Madam C lives in a forum flat, and it's owned by her spouse. They have four children together, and they're all females. They are now married and live apart from them. And these four daughters are very, very dedicated caregivers, they visit the patient on a daily basis, two by two rotation, they assist with all the ADLs and together with the helper as well. And the spouse who is old, um, also elderly and also has his own chronic diseases uh, and requires a full-time helper as well. And they share a room with the the elderly gentleman who is the spouse as well as the helper who sleeps in between the both of them. Um, she already has in place the hospital bed and air mattress. Yeah, it's quite typical actually. Okay, so just to journey with the patient. In 2016, this um, patient was actually homebound ambulant and still walking. Um, in 2018, she became quite homebound and on wheelchair and she was moderate to max assistance by then. And then in 2020, um, she, 2021, she came to us, but in between then, she actually had five admissions between the two years. And by the time we saw her in 2021, she, she was already bedbound, max dependence, and she was cognitively impaired. And within the half a year, she had two admissions. Okay, so you can see the whole host of issues we identified for her and it was quite overwhelming during the first um, visit because not only that she had a lot of medical issues that we need to solve, nursing care that we need to manage and a lot of emotional and caregiver stress um, from the family as well. Okay, so with all my experts here, <laughs> this is the best place to ask questions, right? So reflecting back on my practice, I, I, I constantly ask myself, you know, how should we care for this team? Is there any way that we can approach this case in a holistic manner? And, you know, with so many um, problems on board, you know, what are the priorities for each of y'all when y'all see the patient and as a team as well? How do we approach this? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Priscilla. So um, we have also specially uh, planted 
a spokesperson for the caregiver here. That's why we have Jing Hui. Um, so um, looking at this caregiving situation, I mean, we start with the caregiver. So this uh, um, uh, perhaps a senior spouse who is a caregiver and then using your mind reading superpower, being a caregiver yourself, what do you think are his needs? Thank you. <laughs> so, um, in terms of his needs, I feel that um, for his needs for himself, he will need to take some time to care for himself because um, being a caregiver, especially to a dementia patient with PPSD and um, disrupted circadian rhythm, uh, they might feel very stuck. They will feel very very tired and burnt out and. Um, they might not feel that they have time for themselves to care for themselves. And in terms of the uh, needs of like caring for the patients, I believe he will need some guidance on mm. like what is the care plan for the patients. Because I uh, heard that she got four dedicated daughters who might have four different opinions on how to care for the daughter uh, for the mother. So he might have he, he might not know what opinions to listen to mm. or like um, or he feels that if I don't listen to this daughter then will she will she be okay with that or will there be any resentment between the uh, family so um, I, I feel that he need guidance and it's not just like um, uh, what you think or uh, what you want but some firm guidance on what the profession uh, healthcare professional otherwise he will feel very lost and potentially might just shut down for the care for the patient. Eh? So that's yeah. my view. Thanks, Jing Hui. So in a way, the care system is really driven by lay people, you know, family, and with a lot of attachment and ties to the person who is suffering. So in a situation like that, I mean, this is very special work in a community, different from in a, um, say, acute hospital or community hospital. So Sylvia, being a, such an experienced palliative community nurse, you know, um, and uh, obviously there are a lot of nursing issues. So as a nurse, how would you approach such a case? Imagine this is like a first assist, first visit for you. What are the things you would do to approach this case? Can you hear me? <laughs> I think we need to turn it on manually, but... Uh, it, loves, it loves my voice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is indeed a very, very, um, it's considered complex uh, patients because not only the personal care, but really, really there's a lot of uh, social environment and even uh, really, really, um, uh, there are many, many things involved. So I like the way how Priscilla actually put it. What are the main issues identified? So definitely as a community nurse, um, whether or not you are actually a community nurse, um, so-called like uh, in the general home nursing um, service, or whether you are community palliative care nurse. So when we talk about person-centered care, right, I always actually think about really the patient, the person herself or himself, and also who are around this person. Yeah, so I will normally really just kind of start with asking the family because um, this patient is actually cognitively impaired already. Yeah, and to understand who she is as a person first from the family perspective, whether or not it is from the elderly spouse or even all the daughters. So definitely if for this patient, I will hope that in, during the first visits, um, I can actually get the chance to meet everybody. Because only that, you probably probably in a uh, first setting, you can actually kind of explore a lot more about the family dynamics, who patient is as a person, yeah, what is the main issues, or what the family sees actually is happening right now. Their understanding of what is going on, whether medically, yeah, or, the, or, or whether the physical deterioration, or why patient is actually like this at the moment. So really exploring their understanding, uh, understanding their um, dynamic, even financial aspects of things and who are their support system who are the network of communities around them yeah those are very very important thing to even start exploring at the very first visits so as a nurse I feel that we are always are given a very privileged position because they often are the you know, in a nurse led service you are just there alone maybe yeah so sometimes like say I practice in a home palliative care setting so if this is a new case to me we have the luxuries or uh, um, uh, resources to do a joint is knowing that yeah, the psychosocial, emotional, or spiritual aspect of care for this patient is actually tremendous. 
Right, if we can actually go in the very first visit and divide and conquer to know more comprehensively, then that will be quicker for us to formulate what will be the priorities. You know, we cannot sort resolve everything within the first set, uh, first uh, visits, for example. But how do we actually prioritize as a team, right? So if let's say I look at this patient, certainly after understanding from the elderly spouse, how um, the spouse sees the her uh, he uh, is a is a female patient, right? Yes. Yeah, the the husband, the physical uh, is that a physical limitation to start with caregiving? How is his emotional or psychological well-being? Right? What is his understanding? Yeah, and then um, yeah, to get started with um, and then slowly, slowly actually actually plan up because maybe for this patient's subsequent visit, I would definitely want to actually bring in perhaps a social worker with me. If I sense that there's actually a psycho-emotional coping difficulties, I would not wait for it yeah, until the really the um, issue surface in a more obvious way. Because really as a nurse, I feel that by medically assessing this patient is very important because knowing where patient is right now in terms of even the illness trajectory yeah, and, and what is going to happen, that means pre and what is going to happen, uh, in itself is actually very crucial because without that ability to recognize it is very difficult, as what Tim Hui said, to direct or even um, suggest to the family what is ahead. Yeah, so even talk about, for example, your goals of care, which is uh, going to be very, very important. Yeah, so um, so I would actually approach from this, mm -hmm. from the very first visits. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Sylvia. And this case does illustrate the importance of nurses, because nurses um, coach and guide and being the confidant for families in the caregiving journey and even also dabbling in the psycho-emotional support. But what about the doctor? You see, we are trained in, you know, approach a case with chief complaints and then try to make a diagnosis and then give some kind of prescribed medications and then problem solved. So if you are a doctor working with a case like this, what do you think is the role of a doctor? I mean, where do you start, you know? Yeah. If you are like a doctor visiting, where do you start? <laughs> Thanks, uh, Wei Chong. Uh, I'll take this question with a very unconventional answer first. Uh. So I've got a friend who is a very good plumber, uh, of course, many years my senior. Uh -huh. So he went to my house to do renovation work. He told me, you know, uh, honey, when I go to a uh, toilet, uh, I look, I know where the problem is already. And he <laughs> says, you know, as a good doctor, I'm sure. So you go to the hospital, you sense the environment, uh, you see, 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 and then you know where the problem is already. <laughs> And I reflected on it and I said, it's true, you know, I'm sure everyone has these encounters of very good clinicians, whereby they go into a setting, whichever setting it is, in a hospital, or a home care, or a community hospital, through the experiences, they can see what they need to see, because they know what they're looking for. And they sense the environment very quickly, they know where the problems are, and they prioritize, right? So in the same way, we, if we take a step back from this case, it's important first to size up the family, like what our previous speakers have mentioned, right? So in my mind, when I go and see such a, a, a complex case uh, with multiple multiple family members, perhaps with different agendas and different knowledge base. I also do my own sensing, uh, like my plumber friend, right? Uh, I'm a bit of a cognitive sort, uh, so I was thinking how to explain this uh, uh, yesterday night, right? So I, in my mind, there's this three axes. Uh, so for particular caregiver, right? Uh, I'll weigh them according to these three axes. Capability and knowledge, or rather capability and dedication, one axis, right? Number two, insight and oversight second axis, right? Third axis, emotional stability and spirituality. Mm. So I give you extreme examples to illustrate. So if a person has got very good dedication, good capability, right? Has good oversight and insight of the entire problem, spiritually very strong. Say, I'll handle it. I know that I can dedicate the caregiver role uh, to this uh, family member. I teach him well, he can carry it out. I have no fear and concern. Versus the absolute nightmare, whereby <laughs> not dedicated, want to take care of the patient at home, don't want to touch the patient at all, emotionally very anxious and keep calling for help. When patient die, the whole world collapse and want to die. <laughs> I'm sure we've seen all these patients before in our clinical encounters, right? So when we go into, for example, a family conference or we go to a home environment, we also sense the situation. I'm sure look, Sister Sylvia, everyone will go and sense out the environment, the portrait, uh, who is in the portrait, uh, what's the sanitary condition of the household, uh, where's the patient lying? on, is it the living room or is it the bedroom, is there soiling of uh, stains of feces and urine on the floor. From that we already sense the environment and then when we speak to the family we size them up, 
we know what kind of family dynamics we are dealing with, we know the individual capability and weakness of each carer, we send out who is the predominant voice that's you know, leading the family discussion, and then we try to then complement uh, the, the, the deficits of the family member. So if the problem is not with dedication and capability, like this case, she has got four daughters that's very dedicated to care, then uh, is there an issue with, for example, you know, uh, an issue with uh, insight and oversight, and that can be given. Right? Uh, is there an issue with spirituality that we can kind of augment? So when we go into a complex situation, you know, what we, we must first think, what would a family want of a medical team? Uh, to welcome a medical team, uh, many doctors, nurses, social workers entering a, a family, it is like an invasion of their privacy. You, you need to have them trust you. So the first question to ask is, what do they need from me? In, in a complex situation whereby the patient keeps admitting in the hospital, multiple medical problems, cognitive impairment, functional impairment, behavioral problems at night, everyone is stressed out. What the family members are usually look out for is clarity and consistency. Mm -hmm. What kind of clarity? Clarity as to you know, what exactly is going on with my mother. What do I expect on a longer term mm -hmm. basis? Right? Short term, you know, uh, what's going to happen in the short term? What are the problems I have to deal with? And then in the immediate future, if she were to die, what would she die from? Mm -hmm. right? And uh, what are the resources that I can activate? What must I do when a crisis presents? Right? So these are the immediate concerns from the family. So if you are able to then size up the situation and tell the family, okay, your mom has got dementia, she has been falling, she has got multiple problems, she's very frail, and the usual things that will happen to her the next couple of months is going to be pneumonia, urine tract infection, and falls. Right? The longer term problem you have to deal with is the behavior at night. Uh, I know that's causing a lot of stress to the family. We may need to give some medications to calm them down so that you can rest and she can rest, and we have some basic sanity at home. Right? And if things happen, it's likely going to be a new pneumonia, it's likely going to be an infection, then that's where the ACP comes in. We say, mm -hmm. let's have a consensus within the family. What is the general direction that we need to take? And that consensus within the family has to be clear and consistent. Because the family member is not the medical team. They will be always emotionally embroiled in the patient's care. Right? While we can be clear and consistent in our goals, the patient's family's emotional attachment to the patient will make them sway. And that's when it's important for us, whenever we go back to encounter the patient and family, be it doctor, nurse, or social worker, to keep to a consistent stance within the team. What is the goals of care? What is the plan that we have discussed about? We hold the family steady and remind them of the plan. And that clarity and that consistency is important to guide that way through. So once we have established what is the goals of care, the goals of care can may, may be to reduce hospitalization, to make sure mom is comfortable at home, to aim for a death at home if possible. That might be the objective. If that's the objective that we can all agree on, then the plans will hover around this objective and we empower the family members to do that. And that will be the focus of this discussion. The rest of the things like, for example, high blood pressure, la, diabetes control, la, is it really important? If the BP is 160, does it matter? If the HbA1c is 9, does it matter? Right? When the, the immediate cause of that may be a pneumonia unrelated you know, to the HbA1c or lipid level or mm -hmm. blood pressure. So by prioritizing what is the goals of care, we can also prioritize where to focus on and then we empower the family accordingly. I'll just highlight one more point before I pass the point in time back to Wai Chong. You know, I fully agree with what Dr. Angel Lee has mentioned. I suspect uh, Professor Dan Meyer probably mentioned the same thing, which is that um, death has been increasingly medicalized in the community. One, two generations ago, it's all about caregiver, hands-on, with the patient physically, and then we go through the process as a family. It is a family affair. Now it has been so medicalized that family members are trained to be problem solvers. They try to look for a problem and solve it. Right? Most of the time it works, but at some point whereby it gets so complex, problems cannot be solved. And that's when we have to train them to deal with uncertainties. Right? We have to train them to deal with uncertainties by keep bringing them back to a consistent and clear goal. Keep reminding bank the back on the same discussion we had, same goals or care, same plan, hold them steady. So that in uncertainty, they have a basic principle to go on and clearly then move ahead with that plan. Mm. Okay, thanks. thanks Excellent much. answer from Han Yu and, and Sylvia. And uh, what I hear that's uh, consistent is that uh, the approach begins with very thorough assessment. 
And in the assessment, I also can see come forth from both of them that uh, the competency in relationship, in communication, in sensing the nuances is so important if we were to develop teams like that. But I'm just wondering, would the social worker be out of work? So now here we have uh, YE here. Um, but of course, they won't be out of work because there's so much in store. So I'd like her to comment on a caregiver such as um, Madam C's husband. What does she think based on her experience? What are the things that we really need to look out for if you're caring for a team like that? Uh, thanks, uh, Wai Chong. What you have just heard from Sylvia and Han Yi, yeah, if I were to be the social worker on this team, definitely my life would be much <laughs> easier. Yes. <laughs> I won't be out of work, but you know, uh, yeah, my work would be so much easier. I can go home on time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and both of them really embodied this. Um, very transdisciplinary approach to mm. care, yeah, and uh, have really touched on not only the medical and nursing aspect, but the psychosocial, spiritual aspect, uh, you know, uh, the needs of the patient and the family. So it's very systemic in their approach. I like what Sylvia was saying that right from the start, um, start them right get the family conference going, get everybody around, and then try to understand where they are. And if that is the start, I think subsequently, the social worker's role really can then be um, using that as a stepping stone, mm. uh, knowing that in the illness trajectory, things changes. Honey was talking about uncertainties. yeah, and. For the social worker then to take on the challenge of supporting the family to navigate those um, uncertainties and changes. Um, Hai Yi provided a very good roadmap for the team to work with the family. I think um, working out the roadmap would then require the social worker's input too. You know, doctor always give the prescription, <laughs> yeah, but social workers are the ones who have to roll up our sleeve, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, building on what both of them have just said, yeah, I, I look at my priority, yeah, um, supporting this family, not only the spouse, but also the four uh, daughters and the paid helper there. Now, it this is almost too ideal a case when we look at, ha, huh, the hardware is there, the warm bodies are there. Mm. So what is the problem, mm. you know, with care? And yet when we look at the patient's care, it's not ideal. Mm. Right? We talk about the fluid um, uh, overload, we talk about um, the frequent IDC infection and also something is not working out. Mm. So the curiosity of the social worker will be, ha, ah, what is not working out mm. yeah, in, in, in this uh, context? Then I, I'd like to perhaps draw all of our attention to the tension sometimes, how we map things out for the family and how the family may perceive things differently mm. and to see if we could kind of close that gap there. Now, for our convenience, many times we try as healthcare workers to identify a primary caregiver mm. right? so that it's easy for us to communicate. Yeah. Yeah, it's just so many people in the family, and if you are on the home care team, you, you may, you know, have this experience going in and talking to different people in the family. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for our own mental health sake, we always want to identify a primary caregiver. Mm -hmm. But this case gives us a very good, you know, um, uh, 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 insight into the way family might not organize care in the way we imagine. First, our own idea of caregiver. Who is this caregiver? Yeah. Sometimes, the one written on our notes as the emergency contact 
<laughs> is the caregiver, but sometimes they are not. Mm. Sometimes the one, the name given to us may be the decision maker, mm. but they may not be the caregiver. Mm. So the understanding of different roles uh, that family members play is is essential for mm. me to know. Yep. Who's the decision maker? Like Hai was talking about, who has that capacity, right? Mm. The insight. Ah, who's the caregiver? Hopefully, it's the one with the capacity and insight, lah, not mm. the one who <laughs> is doing the complaints. Yeah? yeah. So, I want to know who the caregiver is, who the decision maker is, and who is available mm. whenever we are there. Maybe the helper is always there and mm. she's available, but she's definitely not the decision maker. Understanding that difference, and then the other concept of breaking down this care into caregiving tasks. Mm. So we have four daughters here and they come in two by two wow, on rotation. Very nice. Like, but what do they do in terms of caregiving tasks? Who actually is the one who will accompany the patient on appointments? Who is the one paying the bills? Yeah. Who is the one talking to the doctors and getting updates? Yeah, etc. I think all these nuances are important for me so that I understand the dynamic of this family and then recognize all the daughters, including the spouse uh, and the helper, as a team of care partners that mm -hmm. I have to work with. Mm -hmm. Complex, yes. If you have one caregiver, actually, <laughs> it's much easier, right? Mm -hmm. But now, we need to extend it and consider who does what. Mm -hmm. And then when we have this network of support, mm -hmm. then we have to say, how does that impact the care of the patient? Mm -hmm. Here, I would be very interested to look at why are they anxious? Mm -hmm. yeah, we talk about uh, good care. So care is good, enough warm body, but why are they anxious? Different daughters may be anxious about different things. So I won't take the assumption that they are all anxious about the same thing. Some people may be anxious about how they are doing. Right? Mm -hmm. Or am I giving good enough care? Yeah. Uh, am I doing the right thing? Some people may be anxious about the perceived suffering that they see in the patient. Some may be anxious about the impending death of the patient. Mm -hmm. So when we say anxious, I think we need to unpack. Mm. Yeah. Oh, what's the underlying causes of the anxiety among different family members? Mm. So indeed, back to what Sylvia has said, getting the family to have that conversation is important. Yeah. Wow, that's such an expert, <laughs> expert ex opinion. I mean, for me, I've, I've worked with seniors like that, but uh, why you really... Tells the, um, shares the intricacies of creating structure out of a system when there is actually no structure. It's just a fuzzy family coming together and created this system and the internal workings of anxiety. And that's, thank you very much, Wai. So we have a second case and I do not want to miss it. So after that, then a discussion again before we go into Q&A. So maybe Priscilla could share on the second case, please. Yes, um, thank you very much for everybody's input and really make me reflect a lot about the practice and how we care for this patient. Patient is still alive, actually. Yeah. And um, so this second case that I'm going to share um, is a case that made a lot of impact on our team because it uh, caused quite a bit of distress after the patient passed away. Um, Mr. T, he's an 83-year-old male upon admission in 2018 and he was referred from the restructured hospital. So upon admission, some of the re services requested were home medical, home nursing and home therapy because the patient had just um, um, suffered a stroke. So they wanted some chronic disease management and this patient was still on nasogastric tube feeding and the helper was new and they required caregiver training as well. So this patient was actually put on an active home rehabilitation program, including speech therapy as well, because the family was keen to wean her off the nasal gastric tube feed and then uh, continue on with, try to continue on with life as, as per normal. Okay. Okay, so this is the past medical history, as you can see, the list is more than five again, and the typical are the diabetes, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and stroke, um, some fractures. 
Okay, and the social setup is that uh, Mr. T has got three children and he stays in a four-room flat with the younger son and this younger son is married with two children and that's their family unit that they stay together in. They have a hired helper and the main caregiver is the helper as well as the daughter-in-law. Um, they have all the necessary equipment like hospital, air mattress, commode and wheelchair all in place and the key point in this is that Mr. T and his youngest son, they share a very close relationship. Okay, And so the progression over, over the years since we took care of the patient in 2018 was that the patient was initially bed bound, she, um, he had ng tube feeding and he had also very severe BPSD shouting and consistently asking for food. And so um, when we took over the care, actually the patient did improve. They, um, the patient was able to be weaned off NG tube, sit out of bed, even go to a day rehab centre at one point of time. But things took a turn um, in the late 2020. The patient started to lose weight. Um, he had um, on and off complaints of abdominal pain and you know we've tried to troubleshoot and solve issues for them. Even once sent the patient to emergency department only to return with um, no nothing done. The, the ED just basically, we, do, we don't quite know what's wrong. Either you admit or then you go home. And so later on, the patient actually continued to deteriorate and passed on. And this is the part that was a little bit difficult to manage, which is... Sorry. Uh. Yeah. Okay, in 2021, um, we were activated because the patient was noted to be drowsy again and then had generalized edema and also still recurring abdominal and specified pain. And BP was already lowish and the patient had very poor appetite, so we were suspecting maybe there was some kind of sepsis going on or there's some underlying cause that needs to be uh, investigated. And we, we spoke to the son and we, we said that, you know, either you... As per what the discussion was, you stay home and then we manage the patient symptomatically or the other option is to go back to the ED for investigation. Um, back and forth, um, son actually refused ED admission because the previous trip to ED yielded nothing. So he's like, then what's the point? So they're agreeable for follow-up in about a week. But after that, um, the son's still not keen in between to send to hospital and went to consult a GP downstairs. So this GP said, hey, you know, you should go to the emergency department. So perhaps hearing from a different person's point of view, they decided to send and the patient actually passed away in the hospital quite shortly um, within two weeks of admission. So um, Mr. T's son is of course very distraught upon uh, the passing of his beloved father. And then later on, we received quite a huge complaint from the family that, you know, we mismanaged the patient. And um, <laughs> it was a very distressing period for all of us during that time. Yeah, yeah I remember I had to, you know, after receiving a complaint, you take, take it seriously, right? So I had to talk to the doctor involved as well. So I was really confused. He said, I know he was near end of life, referred to the hospital, he didn't want to go. So Priscilla, when you received this complaint, how did you feel? Um, <laughs> I was actually quite traumatized by the whole situation because during that period of time, we kept very close in contact with family and actually I was on leave but I took his phone call because I knew mm. that the family was in distress and and it was very puzzling to me as well because initially we did offer him to go back to the emergency department for investigation because I could feel from the son that he was not ready yeah. and therefore we, we offered but then he did he opted not to and then after he went to seek another professional's opinion, then he decided, okay, I'll send. And then after that, it came to us as a big shock. <laughs> so the first question, actually, I'd like to pose to Han Yu because we really, very fortunate, he's the chairman of the ethics committee in Tandong Singh, surely received a lot of complaints. So, you know, in a case like this, you know, that uh, the sun is inconsistent, it's almost like, um, you know, there's nothing you can do. And so, I mean, do you see such inconsistency and um, what do you think are the issues? Yeah, thanks, <laughs> Awe Chong. We, we, we go back to that three axis thing that I talked about, right? If this person, this son has been someone that's dedicated, capable, good insight, good oversight, spiritually strong, no complaints will come to us. 
right? Mm. Now, the problem is that assuming this son is dedicated and knowledgeable, right? Then uh, he's in a confused state. People have been advising him to go ED. Uh, and looking at the situation in ED, uh, the, the presentation at ED, it's not something that they can give you an answer overnight with just a blood test on the x-ray. The patient will likely we need to be admitted for further blood tests, CT scans, find out whether there's a cancer, find out whether there's kidney impairment, heart failure. But he AOR discharged the patient. So I'm just wondering in my mind whether there's a question of uh, miscommunication in the ED or problem with insight and oversight of the problem. Right? And then whether, you know, at the back end there's guilt issues or emotional issues within the family that we don't know of. So this is something interesting for humans. Right? We, we all want a very controlled setting whereby everyone is rational. We say one time, everyone clear, no problem. We stick consistently. Don't go back on your words. Don't go and put things into my mouth. You know? But humans are complex. Right? Humans are complex. And uh, if, when humans face with a crisis, right? Um, the, there are adaptive behaviors and maladaptive behaviors. Right? The adaptive behaviors you hardly hear because they self cope already. They will have rationalized my father, oh, so many illness. My HNF team told me something might happen. If you really want to find out, better go to the hospital and check it out. They will have self reflected and no problem. Right? The one that comes to us are those with maladaptive behavior. Maladaptive behavior are often those that things of uh, health, death, disease as problems to solve. And then, especially, uh, sorry, uh, the engineers, the teachers, the accountants. <laughs> doctors, maybe? <laughs> doctors, yes. Doctors too, yes. yeah. Because we are trained to be problem solvers, you see. We always go and root cause analysis. You know, now we all go for causes. Root cause analysis. And where is the primary root problem? Then sure can solve one, you know. So that's one problem. We, we medicalize there to the extent that even our family caregivers things of death and disease as a problem that can be solved. You know. The second problem here, you know, besides the family trying to find a problem to solve it, uh, is the problem that, um, that's my second point here. Uh, uh, okay, so just let me recollect my thought a bit. Huh? Uh, ah, second thing here is um, Singaporeans, uh, uh, especially, you know, when something goes wrong with a problem that couldn't get solved, right? We don't cope by thinking, ah, this is natural, uh, life, disease and death. No. We cope by attributing blame to someone. Someone must be accountable for the misfortune in my life. It's actually a very narcissistic kind of personality mm. trait, you know. But if you reflect upon people that we meet around, right, that's, that's unfortunately <laughs> how we all become, you know. When there's something wrong in my life, someone needs to get the blame for it, you know. And the person that comes into contact closer to me will get the blame, right? So whoever that gives the phone call to them, hey, how are you feeling after your father died? <laughs> Then they will start rationalizing, you know, the people who try to actually reach out to, to help you cope with the problem will get the blame. Uh, it's you, you never tell me early enough. If you told me early enough, I would have brought her. Because it's always easier to attribute blame on an external party than to accept that very difficult feeling of remorse and guilt. Hey, maybe I, I should have listened to the doctor earlier on. Maybe I should have acted on it earlier on. It's easier to cope that way by attributing blame. Uh, finding some form of anger uh, because anger gives you a lot of energy you know wow, it's your fault your fault and then you don't have to blame yourself and then you feel very vulnerable to it that's part of people's coping mechanism so when we deal with complaints and all that um, we have to be rather objective take a step back you know, yes, we'll feel very aggrieved uh, that, hey, I tried my best, but you still put blame on me. But we have to be objective in a few dimensions. Uh. Number one, if we feel f fulfilled that standard of care, we have no guilt that, you know, uh, we have not done enough for this patient, right? Uh, we have another peer that comes in, look at the case, and no, nothing wrong. Then we should not be fearful of medical litigations, right? Because we'll only be held accountable for medical negligence only if we deviated from a standard of care which is judged according to peers of our same similar standing. Right? So if we are quite certain that we have not deviated from standard of care, there's no gross negligence, then we don't worry about the legal part, la, the SMC complaint la, and all that. Right? Like the recent Tantoxing case, uh, I'm very glad that Justice Chuan Tate gave us justice. <laughs> <laughs> so in that case, we, we shouldn't be worried. worried right? The second thing is that sometimes when these family members um, throw um, Un unpleasant things at us, you know, we have to somehow think about it. Are they 
taking us as an opportunity to rationalize, to make sense of the situation, to make themselves feel better. And then the next question is, you know, by arguing with him, by rationalizing with him, is it going to help? If it's not going to help, sometimes it's better to let him think of us as the bad person <laughs> and let him use us as a coping mechanism. If he really wants to escalate the matter to the ministry, to AIC, to whoever, let it be, and then we answer it calmly. If he gives us an opportunity to work with him, for example, through a social worker, or through a, a nurse with rapport, you know, then we work along uh, back end uh, prospectively. But if there's no opportunity to, then we just take it that this is part of life because we cannot aim for 100% all the time. We can try to strive to be a very good institution, but there will always be situations that's not within our control. You know, emotional liability, coping mechanism, guilt and remorse. Uh, it's always easier for us to be the person for them to blame on sometimes. Right. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, Han Yu. I mean, if, you could hurt, I mean, if all the healthcare workers have heard what you just said, a lot of burnout would have been avoided. <laughs> and a lot of this, you know, brain drain. So um, I know YE has done a lot of research in grief and loss, and this situation could have been also a reaction to it. So perhaps, YE, could you educate us on grief and loss issue, and then how would you guide family in their grief journey? And maybe you can also tell us, share with us what you do in each mat I mean, grief matters. Yeah, yeah thanks, uh, Wei Chong. As I was looking at this uh, case, I thought I was looking at a different son that Hani described. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, naturally, because um, from a community uh, a, a provider for bereavement support yeah sometimes we we are the holding space for people who have a lot of unhappiness um, and grief and if they go to the organization for a complaint they will also come to grief matters and tell us that they have this Complain. Yeah. Usually, what I will do is to first find out what's the complaint about. Yeah. Most of the time, it's a sense of injustice being done. Hmm. Yeah. Injustice being done, and in what ways? And I will be curious also. Injustice being done to the patient, to the family. Yeah. And that's why they have this feeling of uh, anger. Yeah. And with anger, anger is a grief reaction. Right? It's, it's, a, it's part of grief. And anger usually stems from hurt and disappointment. So something that this son had wanted in terms of the care for his father uh, may not have worked out. Or it could be disappointment in terms of expectation of something he thought he could do for father did not work out or something he expect from the care team was not delivered so this these times usually i i cannot take sight although i was a palliative care social worker i cannot tell him are you sure or not? The way I know about health teams and all these good teams, uh, they can't be doing this. And I, I won't be doing psychoeducation. Mm. Yeah, that, that's not my job anymore. Mm. Now, in that context, when they come in, I will also be very curious about certain things that Priscilla said about the family setup. One, youngest son. What happened to the other two siblings? Why is he doing this all by himself, mm. right? And over the years, if this home nursing team has come in since 2016 all the way to 2021, it's a long time, yeah? And what happened? What was his experience with this care team? You know, sometimes as healthcare workers, I move from team to team, agency to agency, and there may be some ruptures in relationship the discontinuity in care, right? That the family have experienced, but because you are still the care team, they put up with us, yeah? Mm. It will become cumulative. The dissatisfaction, the unhappiness may be cumulative. Sometimes it's not the fault of the 
home nursing team. They are downstream and they get it. But over the years, this family and this son may have multiple experiences interfacing with different healthcare teams and the system. Yeah. And that frustration, the, the anguish he might have experienced across time could be built up. Coupled with the incident, the death event, of course, it just you know erupt. So understanding that context will help me see him in a very different light. Yeah. And then knowing that perhaps across this period of time, one suspicion I had when I look at this case is this son's this son may have a perceived a perception of not being supported well enough. Yeah, the perception of not being supported could be huge. The mistrust, the challenges they, he might have, the experiences he might have with past care team could all add up to his anger and frustration. So understanding this helped me to see his grief in a different light. And then of course I will bring in the other dimension, the relational part of things. Who is father to him? The attachment, the connection, and what does that mean for him to have to experience the sudden deterioration of his father? So agree with Heini here that sometimes it could be disappointment with himself to being helpless and not knowing and able to do anything to stop the deterioration, to stop death. Yeah. So my job really is to help him open up and look at all these possibilities and how that might have contributed to his bereaved, uh, the grief experience. Mm -hmm. And of course, the last bit is, I also have to prepare him the outcome of his complaint, right? If he get a complaint, uh, if he put up a complaint and does he feel justified? Did, did he feel it was, it was uh, addressed that he's at peace? Chances are mm -hmm. they won't be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So I also need to prepare him that okay, you put up the complaint because you wanted justice for your father. You lend a voice. You know, make sure future users of this service will not have the same experience. If it did not meet what you set out to meet, how are you again going to deal with that disappointment? So. I have to address that as well. Hmm. And that is all part of grief work. And indeed, the action of putting up a complaint in itself is telling me where this son is in his grief experience. Yeah? When you talk to someone at different time of their grief, uh, they may give you very different uh, 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 sharing about their experience. So that Again, supporting him, journeying him to see that there may be other um, facets of his grief that he has to address instead of just focusing his energy on looking at the complaint. Mm. Excellent. Thank you, Y.E. for giving. For me, I learned that grief work is... It's very deep work. It cannot be transactional, like one visit, two visits, you know, utilization of resources, but it's really a lot of... Imagine if you don't have search working through. Now that after hearing from YE, I just realized after handling a complaint, I thought everything was settled, but he could be still brewing in it. And what would happen is if the time come for him near the death of his life or other loved ones, his behavior would... would it's going to be difficult for the for all the healthcare workers, health systems, and he's probably not the only one in Singapore that experienced such um, grief management. So grief work is really, really important. Thanks for the insight. I'd like to hear from Sylvia. So imagine this gentleman was, well, they heeded our advice, you know, um, did not go to hospital, and now the blood pressure is dropping. There's this abdominal pain and pitre edema. And uh, of course, without the, uh, the, the, the investigations of the hospitals, and then you're supposed to palliate such a person. How, what would you uh, approach? How would you palliate? How do you relieve the symptoms or you know, managing the family at the same time? Hello? Yeah. Hello? 
Oh, ah, yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. So um, I would see it from, like, say, a lens of a nurse. Yeah. So um, if uh, this patient, I've been caring for him for many years. So it is actually very, very important for me to know how this patient has been in terms of the trajectory. So if I can see it clearly, with even the help of my medical team people, then perhaps we were really, really, as what um, Han Yi and Wai Yi has talked about, really, really map and paint this picture to this son, right? So knowing the frustration of what Edi told him, yeah, perhaps maybe we can be the um, person that really helps him if he doesn't believe in me or our team, I can actually help to connect other teams with him. So when Priscilla talk about GP, that is a good option. But perhaps I really, really will really elaborate the son's concern. As in, you know, all the doctors that I bring my father to said that nothing was wrong. So that itself seems to be helping him on the fact that, you know, what's the point of bringing him to hospital? Or ET. So perhaps I see who are around me as a team that can tap on. Yeah? So and really, really narrate this piece of information that is very crucial to the other teams that this son is going to bring the father to. Right? Even if, like, say, offering to talk to the ED doctor, for example, yeah, if really, really, no matter what we say, he doesn't even want to see anyone other than, you know, uh, being at home, then perhaps I will really, really ask him, will you be surprised that, you know, father, so, so helping him to see how father has been and how father is right now to help him reflect whether is there a change in father's condition to make him hopefully realize that things are different. And sometimes we do have a lot of families um, are like that. They, no matter what you say, they just don't, don't get it or don't understand or refuse to understand. But sometimes I feel that by asking them a very provoking questions, yeah, what if one day you wake up and see that father is not breathing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and somehow I find that very bad. Of course, in order to say that, right, it is not easy for a healthcare professional or even a nurse to say that because they can actually turn around, you know, and, and scold you for nothing. And then how do you say, what makes you say that my father is dying, right? Or is deteriorating? But I find it's extremely useful because all the more if, let's say, um, Home Nursing Foundation is are caring for homebound, frail elderly. As we all know, that frailty itself can be a very, very good indicator already. Mm-hmm. And I'll not be surprised that the patients that I care for would die even quietly in the sleep, mm. right? Moreover, for these patients that is really, really not eating, losing weight, mm. having more and more symptoms, that signifies something. Even if I don't clinically figure out what exactly is going on. Yeah, so, so somehow what I find it helpful is having the courage to say that, you know, looking at all these symptoms and changes, perhaps your father is really not doing well. Yeah, will you, how would it be for you if one day you wake up and realize that father is not breathing and what will you do? Yeah, so I will just wait and hear from the person. Because from knowing what they will do, then hopefully I have more, um, I open up more channels to see whether, you know, what can be put in place. If suddenly this son realized that, oh yeah, maybe my father is really sick, but no matter what, I still want him to be at home, mm. right? Then it makes it very easy because end of life care, my job as a nurse, I will help him see what needs to be done mm. in order to direct and guide him and support him. Yeah, so because he has a very, very um, close relationship. Yeah, so sometimes I'm um, being too very close um, I mean, the psycho-emotional or even anticipatory grief may actually be involved and that can impair their judgment and also their ability to cope. So opening up those exploration and see how this son responds probably would be something that I will try to do together with the support of my own team at the back or even together with me. But suddenly, um, yeah, I, I would say that these patients and even the complaint that came in, right, um, definitely is very draining for the team, no doubt, because all of us, I'm sure all of us will go all out to try and help mm-hmm. the patients that we care for, right, knowing that we have done all that we could. So in order to do this kind of work, I would say that 
team support is extremely important. Mm. Even the day-to-day -day team debrief, right? The response. Because we ourselves are feeling helpless. Because you know that um, maybe this patient needs to get to hospital or this patient is dying, but this son is just not quite there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every day work at the back, at the end of the day, I'm sure Priscilla is very drained. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's precisely the team has to come in, not only for the clinical work itself, but also supporting the um, more of a forefront person that's caring for this patient and the, and the son. And then even after that, yeah, it's our own sense of helplessness that we actually have to talk about as a team. So it's like a team support, even, I would say it's part and parcel of the team spiritual support per se, mm -hmm. right? Our own sense of helplessness, how do we cope with it or accepting it, right? After knowing that we have done all that we could and the best, yeah. And really, we may be grieving as well, right? Because, um, and professional loss and grief in the midst of caring for patients is always and to talk about. Mm. Nobody talk about that. Perhaps yes. really we feel that this patient could be more comfortable, but I can't even do that for this patient. Mm -hmm. So maybe grieving or maybe even feel a sense of powerlessness, helplessness and everything on top of our cognitive functioning at that point in time. So so um, I would say that um, when <laughs> I was actually very excited when I actually kind of look at um, um, Home Nursing Foundation, how they want to embark on this inter, uh, interdisciplinary care path. And I felt that really, really um, the team care for each and individual in the team in caring for these patients and the family um, and that perspect, uh, perspective is actually very important. Thank yeah. you so much, Suthu, for bringing such an important point. You know, almost forgot about self-care. For, um, for, for professional health workers. Actually, in the interest of time, I apologize to Jing Hui, I may not have time to ask you the question, but I still want to ask one last question. Um, it's related to what Ye said, and it was asked by somebody from the audience. How do you identify the main caregivers? There are so many caregivers. The decision maker, or the physical caregiver, or the one who is closest, or what? Ye. <laughs> Yes, the question is for you. Oh, yeah. really? Okay. <laughs> so, of course, we don't go in with a checklist and ask who is the decision maker, who is the caregiver. <laughs> I think it's, we have to extricate it out. Mm. Right? Yeah. So, earlier on, the three of us alluded to going in to sense the family. One of the things that we need to do as part of work is really asking good questions to kind of tease out who is doing what, yeah, and then understanding the dynamics among the, um, family members. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, the one who, you, usually one question, if you want to put it in the open, I will ask it openly, I mean, in an open-ended way and say, how does this family make important care decisions for your mom? Mm -hmm. How does this family do it? Mm. Right. You know, oh, uh, in other families, each family will do it differently. Mm. Right. Sometimes, oh, your father is around. You have four daughters, right? Uh, do you all have to get the yes from father? Mm. Right. Or who else? Uh, do you take the the opinion of the most educated daughter in mm. the family? Mm. Yeah. Oh, because this daughter can speak English. Mm. Right. Oh, oh, what is it? So, by asking how do they make important care decisions, it get them to reflect. And when they say, we don't know, or sometimes we do it this way or that way, that kind of gives me a sense. Maybe the decision making is not one person. The decision making is a process, and we then need to understand the process. Mm. Do they go by the loudest voice? Who pay for care? Right, or consensus, mm -hmm. what is it? Mm -hmm. okay. Then only we can find out when we need to influence mm -hmm. the care and hold the family better, who do we need to go to, mm -hmm. yeah, to, to, to kind of uh, have that conversation first so that the whole family then can loosen up mm -hmm. yeah, in, in, in responding to uh, hearing us uh, presenting the, the, the care options for the patient. Hmm. 
Thank you, Y.E. I think that's about the time we have. I'm, actually, I'd like to hear from the rest, but I think we don't really have the time. We want to hear the keynote, last keynote speaker. So with that, uh, please join me to thank the panel of speakers for their insightful and generous sharing. Yeah, so maybe I hand over the floor to the, the MC. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Ng. <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Neo. Miss Chi, Miss Lee, our dear Jing Hui, and Priscilla. So, Dr. Ng, while we are preparing the stage for our next keynote speaker, Shall we take the time to interact with our <laughs> lovely audience here? Yeah, actually, we prepared some poll questions, but somehow we are not in time to put on the slide. Though, but just like to have a show of hand, how many of you have ever been a caregiver for somebody who subsequently passed away? Can I have a show of hand? Okay, in this room, it looks like it's about um, thirty to forty percent. Thank you. Okay, um, the second. Four questions I'd like to ask is, uh, in your, you know, in the understanding so far from you know, today's very rich um, conference and, uh, and also of your own uh, experience, how well supported are Singaporeans currently? Um, okay, do you think Singaporeans are sufficiently um, supported to pass away peacefully at home? It's a yes or no answer. Those who say yes, please raise your hand sufficiently supported to pass away at home. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, we have about uh, 10 out of this room. Okay, uh, what about those who say no, not, not yet? It's majority, I think about 80%. So, um, yeah, thanks so much. So it does show that, uh, I mean, not all of us have, have the privilege of caring for somebody passing away at home. Um, and, uh, but most of us, based on our experience, we realize that Singapore is not yet ready. There's still a lot of work need to be done. And I'm glad um, our AIC colleagues are here. And uh, <laughs> no, no, I mean, uh, colleagues, we are co-workers. We, we, we have the same allegiance, same vision, same mission. We are, we are the same team, actually. So it's just that uh, policymakers need to balance many interests. It's, a lot, it's not easy to do that, too. And whatever the policy we set need to be sustainable. Even though on the ground we know doctors, nurses, you deal with the pain and suffering. So for you, you have a different perspective, but we need to have all the other perspectives. So with that, I think the stage is ready. So we know roughly 80 to 90% of us think that we are not yet ready, and uh, about 30% uh, have actually been through the journey of a caregiver. So now maybe, Shereen. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Ng. Okay, we'll move on to our final keynote speaker for the day. So um, we are privileged to have with us Miss Sylvia Lee, Advanced Practice Nurse at Dover Park Hospice, and she will be sharing with us the role of the community nurse in timely provision of palliative care for the frail and chronic sick elders. Miss Lee, please. morning. Yeah, my name is Sylvia. Uh, as what Angel said, uh, I'm the last speaker, so I have all the giants, Dr. Diane. I have Angel, I have Karen, I have everybody here. So, so today I'm just going to share really, really from my own lens as a nurse. Yeah, I deem myself as a community nurse. 
also a community palliative kindness. Okay, so perhaps I will probably really, really come in from that lens to share with all of you because Priscilla asked me to talk about what are the skills and competencies that a community nurse require in order to provide, whether you call it as a generalist palliative care or specialist palliative care, irregardless where are the touch points that you are at. Can I have a, just a brief show of hand? How many of you are from home-based services? Okay, home medical, home nursing. Yeah? How many of you are from center-based services? Oh, quite a few. Uh, how many of you are in primary care services? Like polyclinics or things like that? No? Yeah. How many for, uh, of you are actually like a transitional care team people, really coming from the hospital, but go to the patient's home? Anyone here? Nobody. Okay. Yeah. So maybe I'll just start with this. Um, maybe telling all of you a very short story of myself. Yeah. So I'm a general nurse when I started my journey, right? I always, always want to be a geriatric nurse. And that's why I went to actually focus on gerontology nursing as my first specialty. So when I came back to Singapore, I didn't know. All I wanted to know is how do I care for elderly who are dying and how elderly in Singapore dies. That is only the only questions in my mind. So unknowingly, I chanced upon um, a, a, a job yeah, opportunity in, at inpatient hospice. So without knowing what inpatient hospice does at that time, but I only know that people there are terminally ill. So I decided to just want to join and try to learn how do I care for elderly who are dying in Singapore, as simple as that. Without me knowing that at that time, um, hospice actually, inpatient hospice actually uh, focus a lot of oncological patients, right? But definitely they are elderly as well and things like that. So. Yeah, so that was actually my starting journey and really, really my time as a general nurse in acute care hospital, I did not even come across anyone who died under my care. Can you imagine that for a few years? Yeah, so when I went in without um, knowing anything about caring for dying patients, it was a very scary experience because I really don't know how to even recognize that my patient is dying. And who helped me the most at that time? Have a guess. Definitely not doctors, because <laughs> at that time we, we have very, very few doctors. So in fact, those are the ones that really supported me and tell me, hey, Sylvia, this patient is dying. Quickly call the family. Are those nursing aides, yeah, foreign nursing aides that actually have worked probably in the hospice for about maybe um, at least one or two years. Those are one that was my security blanket. I really, really did not know. Then really, really shortly after I joined, and I was very naive. I thought, wow, well, I want to go back to Australia to attend my graduation ceremony. So I want to do seven nights in the hospice. Yeah, I did. And you know how many patients I actually sent uh, to heaven or whatever. Yeah, so I care for 22 patients, and literally after my seven days, I only have about nine patients left. Yeah, at that time, I really, really was very harsh on myself. I was thinking that, is this something wrong that I did, that, that no patient choose to die during my time, and yet I don't know what to do very much besides my junior telling me that, hey, please call the family to come here. Yeah, so I, I realized that as a general nurse, the toughest thing to do is really to recognize that someone is not doing well. Yeah, not to even talk about someone is actively dying. So it is a skill that we have to learn. And But how do we go about learning it? By really, really attending to the course, I realized that many, many community nurses that I come across, they have a tough time to re recognize that, to be honest. So. I actually prepared this actually based on the knowing that community nurses are really, really in a variety of settings. So I actually put it in a general way rather than a very specific so-called like a, you know, a community palliative care uh, nurse, for example. All right. So definitely in today's kind of a 
Healthcare system, as everyone has talked about, we talk about population health, we've talked about regional health system, so really expanding your network of care, and then where are we, ourselves as a nurse in the community situates, also some, something that we want to talk about. So, um, as what Diane, uh, Dr. Diane mentioned, right, um, in Singapore itself, right, we're actually quite fortunate in the sense that we standardise by talking about palliative care, whether is it provided in a hospital, in a community, uh, institution, or even home-based service services rather than really we talk about palliative care versus hospice care or things like that. Literally, simple understanding to me really, palliative care across the care continuum is the most important thing. And the hospice or community hospital or whatever is really the place of care only. The approach, uh, the belief, the skill sets and everything you have should actually carry across the setting. Yeah, It's just that when we talk about end of life care, perhaps we are actually more into a uh, maybe the, the last, you know, the last days, end of life care can be months before the death. But really, really, I'm seeing a lot more as in how do we uh, identify patients early in a very, very upstream, even at the primary care st um, uh, touch point, for example. So I do not want to restrict this sharing to just particular setting or particular uh, ILTC sector. All right, so this is a disease trajectory that everyone is familiar with. You know, we learn on the chart, on the book about different like cancer trajectory, organ failure, you know, even different organ failure tra trajectory can be very different and even dementia and frailty can be very different. So, but what does that mean to individual nurses in the community? It may means nothing because it doesn't translate to practically identify. All right, we have criteria, but sometimes it's really difficult. I'll explain why. Yeah, so this is just an article to talk about really frailty, the degree of it can actually cut across the illness trajectory and in itself can be a very good predictor. All right, so especially for, let's say, a home nursing foundation focused on really frail homebound elderly with can be multiple comorbidities, multiple organ, organ failure plus um, dementia plus plus minus cancer. They have four or five proper terminal illness. Then, of course, that itself is already a very, very, very good predictor already. They are probably in their last uh, one or two years of their life. Yeah, so this is a picture I'll show you again and again if some um, uh, of you may have seen it before. This is what um, comprehensive palliative care look like. So when I was looking at the video uh, shown earlier that by, by the Home Nursing Foundation, it was beautifully done because literally, I, I asked myself, I said, wow, they actually have more services and they can provide that even a home, home hospice. For example, you can move patients be, uh, between medical, home medical, home nursing, even home therapy. You know, currently, for example, my own hospice, our therapist doesn't actually go to the home to provide home therapy, for example but they are um, available to provide consult. Yeah? So, um, so this is what maybe a palliative care, comprehensive one can look like, whether or not it is in a very general setting or in a very specialist setting. It just the difference is only the intensity or the group of patient or complexity that you deal with. Okay, so don't be, uh, oh, this has no pointer, right? So look at the nursing care. You may wonder, I'm a nurse, why do I put a small box below it as nursing care, right? Actually, no, community nurse is really is in the center of this and what you are really need to prepare yourself for in terms of skills, training, and everything is to prepare you to do the whole element of things here. Okay, and the nursing care below is, I'm just talking about basic nursing care element that it is so important and often at times we forgot to do, uh, how to do about it. How many of you are confident that you will know how to do a, a, a good oral care, for example, for advanced dementia patients who is having secretion plus plus, you know, in the oral cavity, they are gurgling away, you know, they appear that they are actually suffering in front of their caregiver. Yeah. How many of you are confident to even do a good oral care practically on this patient? Left, left, left alone, let alone you actually talk about empowering the family members to do it, right? So that is a very simple example. So really, the nurse is a, really a center because it's often nurse-led when we're in the community. So having the skills to do all these things is actually what we envision to be. 
So I want to um, spend a bit of time to talk about really, really, we are quite fortunate with the MOH uh, and even EIC uh, collaboration with the community people. Um, I think in 2017, they came up with this MOH kind of a, a community nursing framework, competency framework. How many of you have looked at it and really, really know how to translate it into your current practice? Can, can I have a show of hand? Nobody. <laughs> Oh, okay. So that precisely is how I felt because the thing that really, really from the industry, service providers, people who are on the ground, you develop this with the government support, but nobody is looking at that. Yeah, but how can we actually make full use of it when we talk about upskilling everyone, okay? So, and really, really badly a, a month ago, and there is this, for years and years, I dream about this happening, palliative nursing competency framework. Yeah, so now really we write on really what ministers push for dying in the community at home. So this actually really, really in a very speedy mode, it happens. And actually I feel very happy about it because this is tremendous years and years of probably decades of dreams of palliative kindness. And but how many of you have read this? Only Priscilla, Angel, okay. <laughs> Not too bad because it's only like launched a month ago, okay? Yeah, so but the question is, yeah, if we have these two frameworks together, but how do we blend it together so that we can actually make something very practical for your organization, okay? Yeah, so community nursing competency framework, if you look together with the palliative nursing care framework, right, it is very similar because it talk about person-centered care, right? The competency element that includes is included are actually very similar, but what would be the main difference? Okay, so we'll kind of talk about it. This is actually a palliative nursing competency framework, right? When we talk about person-centered care, really biopsycho, social, spiritual, but really when you break it down further, yeah, I wouldn't spend so much time, it's really how do we then uh, think about the population you serve, let's say uh, you care specifically for end-stage organ failure patients, think about the nursing staff that you have, like for example, HNF is a very good example because they have a home personal care people uh, up to APN, right? Where do you situate these people, right? Let's say uh, I'm an APN that I have no PEL background. So where am I in this competency framework and how do I develop myself, okay? So I want to highlight the second competency domain that is very unique, I think, to this palliative uh, competency framework is really well-being and supportive care. It is part and parcel of the role of a, uh, a, a, of a nurse, actually. If, if regardless you do a general PEL or specialist PEL, this component can be huge. Really, you learn how to even identify what, I, uh, what you have shared. That patient or person, a person or their loved one is grieving or even having anticipatory grief. What are the signs and symptoms, for example, right? And also, how is the... Um, caregivers mental well-being how do we have difficult conversations to even talk about or tell the loved one that your loved one is dying the word using the word dying comfortably right so it is a tremendous skills here definitely in our nursing schools we don't we probably learn about communication skills yeah but we don't learn about the the rest of things Okay, so this is an area that I want to highlight and, and how do we as an organization, irregardless where you are, you can actually learn about it. Yeah, so just a brief uh, background. I'm not sure um, all of you know that in uh, this, actually get all the services, uh, service providers in community, right? We can actually divide it into really uh, different classes, right? So classly is where am I? I do primarily palliative care, right? In the hospice or home uh, palliative care program, like uh, Karen, Angel, all of them are actually uh, classy providers, right? So perhaps now HNF actually is embarking on doing, really focusing, really the frail elderly, homebound only, and do end of life care, perhaps Perhaps they are the class B providers because they will actually have a lot of patients like that, right? Then of course class A patient, uh, providers are those that they hardly actually come across patients who are having, let's like, say, um, 
uh, 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 so called like you know uh, at the end of life, for example. But they may actually um, at occasionally actually cross, cross path with them. So in terms of nursing, right, we actually kind of think about how do we nationally kind of can subdivide nurses into a different category. So how many of you can confidently confidently say that I'm actually a trained, uh, I'm a nurse who has um, palliative care training. Anyone here? Oh, huh? Uh, some level. Okay, so since Priscilla said some level, so Priscilla, you see, which level are you in right now? Probably closer to level two. Closer to level two. Good. Yeah. So this is just to help us understand as in there's so many training programs out there, whether it's provided or conducted by the palliative care service provider like the uh, Lian Center for Palliative Care or even PELC. But cost, let's say uh, there's actually courses running around for as much LNET, right? End of life nursing consortium. That kind of a cost by one day, one and a half days. Is attending one day cost enough for you to practice, for example, confidently? No, right? So what constitutes that training, that is the most important thing. So basically, uh, anyone who has no training, but knowing what is palliative care in terms of concept and approach, they are probably at the level one. Then the one who has more, maybe a certain like went through certificate course, or even advanced diploma, or things like that, more in depth, and practicing in the group of population that actually really have a, a, a lot of end of, life, end of life patients, then perhaps they are at the actually level two, all right? So really, really the objective of this framework is really helping organization to figure out where are we right now? Who are we serving? What are the palliative care needs of ours, or perhaps specific populations, um, their care needs? And then how do we actually embark on training our nurses to actually gradually get there, for example? I would say that you know, it was a very meaningful journey when uh, I think MOH asked us a few years ago, um, because when we talk about home-based respite care, right? Uh, really patients who want to die at home, but their caregiver cannot cope. The uh, home-based respite care are all the so-called mostly foreign nurses, nursing aides. And they're actually quite afraid because um, the organization told them that you can't even do a suppository dialect insertion. You can't even help maybe the cat family to change, let's say, fentanyl patch. They don't even know what morphine is all about and all the myth involved. How do you even care for patients who are dying, for example, with secretion management? They're afraid. So we see this gap and then we really depend on this group of nursing aides very, very much. And because that's one of the factors that can help patients who want to die at home to have a better support as well, right? So we decided to really develop a program that we think will be helpful for this group of nurses. They are not probably part in the mainstream so-called uh, nursing uh, hierarchies as well. But I see them as the one that really, really have the highest touch point in terms of caring for actively dying patients. So the, it is very crucial. But then how do we pitch let's say, the knowledge and skills to the level that is practical to them, right? So this framework will help. So it really involves the, what is your job roles. It really involves is what are the competence, uh, competency domain and how then you actually match it up, right? I'll just quickly show. So this is just um, a slide that shows that there are different company proficiency level, right? For someone who is new to care for patients who are at the end of life, who are as junior as the nursing aides, then perhaps they are really, we are hoping for a proficiency level one. Right? So that is how the percentage proficiency will grow as you grow mature and you learn more and more things. Yeah. So this is just, uh, I, I will just uh, use this uh, and use a very simple example. Yeah. So this is one of the competency domain, let's say knowledge in terms of level one staff, let's say nursing aides. So principles of palliative care, what palliative care is, they must know. Right? Then uh, stages of dying. Right? So I think when they care for actively dying patients, they should know how to think, very easily identify signs and symptoms of active dying. Right? So this one must know. Yeah. So for example, basic pain assessment, as, uh, there's no point here. Yeah. What is basic pain assessment means to nursing aides? Right? Yeah. Right? So, then the organization have to think, how do I unpack all this and then stratify the knowledge for this group of nursing aides? 
Okay, so this is an example for the dom competency, competency domain of well-being and uh, supportive care, right? So this is actually a combination of things. I like this because if, like, say, I recruited an NC who has no uh, experience in pa uh, caring for palliative care patients, they come into my organization, then I definitely look at what is the job description for her as a nurse clinician. Then I'll go to a competency domain, what is the knowledge and also the uh, abilities that is required for me to train her. Let's say under this uh, well-being and support, right? if I want her to function like level three, so then I will go to the level three portions to understand what are the competency required and the abilities that I want to achieve at the end of the day before I think about what other training that is needed in order to achieve that. Otherwise, if this framework is not being thought through or even being utilized clearly by the organization and the population that you serve, then you will only be um, a document that's lying lying there and nobody's going to look at it. Huh? So I think uh, everyone should be encouraged to look at it. I know it is very worthy, uh, but it really depends on your organization, I feel, based on what the, the services that you are providing, understanding the ability of your staff. And now I always see HNF as a very good example because really, really, um, that's when, when they can map this out then they can think about how, just now I heard um, Priscilla was talking to Waii about how many APN do I need in my service, right? If you can train all level of staff at a different level, different um, competency level, if they are trained in such a way and they grow, in itself is actually a very satisfying journey. And you don't need APNs. Yeah, because yesterday I just get asked this question by my APN interns who is attached to us right now. She said, Sylvia, what is it that is different from what you do and also what your other SSN do or, commun uh, or your com palliative care nurses do? And my answer to her is, there's no difference because everybody, our idea is to train towards that direction. Whether or not you have the title or API, it doesn't matter. It's really the skills that you have and the competency level that you have. So if the only difference that you want to really tease it out is probably perhaps if your organization believes in collaborating, prescribing, uh, those, those, those kind of framework, perhaps you are having a bit more leeway in terms of prescribing. But how many people, how many APNs in the community you can have, right? So it defeats the purpose, I feel. Good to have, but uh, how, how, how many to have probably is not that, that kind of a, a, a important question to me. Yeah. So I always think that community nurses are bridges. Yeah, whether you are wooden bridge, metal bridge. But I like, <laughs> I like this um, uh, picture because it is really like very foggy because it's how we often feel uh, how uncertain we are, right? Because at different level, because most of the community nurses that goes out there are RNs level, whether they can S uh, or SSN level, even NAs level. So when they know, don't even know what they don't know, it is very scary. And why we can't really, so many of us actually raise our hand to say there's support for the family at home. For patients who die at home, it's not quite there yet. It's because we ourselves as healthcare professionals, we are not even confident to do the care that can be done at home. What more we talk about caregivers who are slave person, all right? So, and why is that so that we are breached? Because remember just now the comprehensive palliative care I was showing, yeah? Because we are the bridge to social worker, we are the bridge to the medical team, we are the bridge to the care network, we are the bridge because we are given the very, very precious position to be able to sense and see what is happening in the house and who are there most of the time is us. Right? Because in the nurse led service, if you don't you cannot see what you see or you cannot see what is happening, then definitely we can't say that we are actually providing palliative care because really palliative care is all about the whole person care and that is actually more in that. It's not about you know just on the surface to say that I provide a personal or uh, pers uh, person centered care. So what it means as in the person centered care to you is also something like I, I will urge all community nurses to think about. Okay, yeah, because it can mean many things. I go in, I do the procedure, I get out. That is also, that is just task. It's not care. 
Right? So I like the words because I learned again and again is you know, a lot of patients want to die at home. There's no right and wrong whether you know, do they go back to a hospital or not. But you, if you can reassure and help them see what is ahead, what so much more can be done at home? Because they often hear from the acute care hospital side is that there's nothing more that I can do for you. Then that's the reason why I actually refer you to a community setting. Right? But precisely, they actually hop on that and think about there's nothing more can be done. But to be honest, there's so much more to be done in the home environment, right? So, so I always want to tell like, my patients or their family that and, and really, really nitty gritty in a way to spell out and map to help them see what do I mean by care continues no matter how long or how much time you have, okay? So, uh, so I always like to look at this um, because I started my journey knowing this. Um, actually, it's a model by this uh, Davis and Aubrey. It was a very old model that developed to look at the supportive role of a nurse, whether you are in palliative care or in a, um, any care that with a supportive role. I like how they put it, put it because that is precisely how you translate person-centered care into who you are as a nurse. Not only you are professional, but you are also as a person, right? So as a person, how do we then connect to the patients that we care for, right? How do we even doing for, or doing for even as simple as really your basic fundal basic nursing care? Sometimes I think palliative, good palliative care is also good basic care, all right? So take pride in doing oral care, for example, in a way yeah, that you empower the family to do what as simple as you think, but it can be so empower, empowered so that they can actually really, really uh, ease their anxiety, for example. Huh? So this is a framework. So then, of course, um, finding the champions in, the community, uh, in your teams, really, really, despite you learn a lot from courses for whatever that you attend, really, you need a champion in your team in order to translate what you learn into practice. Yeah, without champion, you can learn and actually, when people changes, everything is losing. Yeah, and also really moving forward, I really hope that right, currently the system is like, uh, either you're in, I'm out. Right, so just like how our relationship with HNF, we really don't see that doing a task, they can do so much better than us by inserting NG tube. But really our sick patient, we really can't afford to go and do a routine change. But then the funding system doesn't allow us to have a dual system in place to maximize what we can do best, right? So I really hope that moving forward, this will change so that it will be really a generous palliative care specialist kind of overlay, a shared care, so that we communicate, so that patients family doesn't have to really really be lost in the system and yet get the best that they can uh, they can get and really the collaborative relationship and relational uh, decision making sometimes really really does help yeah so I would say that this one just um, slowly look at it there are many things out there it's just just that how do we actually put into the specific populations that we, we are serving right now okay I know that uh, not not much time left so yeah I will stop here thank you very much Thank you, Ms. Sylvia. May we invite you to remain on stage okay. and we'll take a few Q&A. Mm -hmm. um, before that, I think we noticed there's some technical difficulties going on for the Zoom audience. Um, we do apologize for it and we seek your kind understanding that we're in the midst of resolving this. So sorry about it. Okay, so Miss Sylvia, the first question, oh my God, this is sounds so nerve wracking. <laughs> okay, the first question we have for you, from the perspective of a nurse, what would you expect in terms of support from the doctor and the social worker? And may I add on the therapist? <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I would say that I'm very fortunate. I have great support, okay? So remember I talk about a nurse as a bridge? Yeah, so I think having um, to train yourself to have the ability 
to assess so so much. I mean, to assess first before you could even really talk about working or advocating for your patients together with the teams, team members that you have is ever so important, right? Because really, really in current model of care, you don't have the therapist on board uh, usually unless you refer. Yeah. So and also um, your doctors may not be there all the same visit every visits that you made. So important thing is really, really have a good assessment skills and knowing what is the skill of the problems and really refer as early as possible so that patient can have a more holistic care. Mm. So I always see us as a door. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. The second question, um, what can we do to attract more novice nurses to the community sector and in particular to build their interest in palliative care? I think uh, this is a very good question to add a lot. Really, really, um, every one of us here can be a role model. Yeah, really, really. You grow a lot more, I would say, in community uh, as compared to acute care setting. Because um, really, often at times, at home setting, you are only having limited resources, whereby when in the hospitals, you have all the manpower resources, structural uh, resources, uh, everything that you have. But be, it also becomes more uh, segmented because everyone is doing, like, you know, taking part of this body or, or rather than a holistic approach. So, but definitely, uh, um, I mean, of course, we really envision with the framework or whatever, I believe, I always think that you know, every nurse should have a palliative care knowledge and approach. Yeah, knowing, because really, really, palliative care is all about um, a human care, right? When you really talk about you care for a whole person, then you can't run away from putting in your palliative care, uh, so-called approach and knowledge. It's just that the more advanced skills you have slowly developed. I would say that nowadays, I think uh, a lot of uh, institutions, academics, academics institution, they actually do allow uh, even the undergraduate nurses to go to community settings, whether right? nursing homes or center-based uh, places to get exposure. Um, so I see that as a potential, and even the community nursing um, scholarship, yeah, those are the opportunity for really brand new nurses to see how exciting community care can be yeah before they can actually think about what is their career focus can be mm. yeah I do agree mm. that we have to be active role models mm. otherwise yes yeah there's probably no other way to do it <laughs> you inspire people from your doing really to yeah. lead by example mm. Okay, yeah. the final question, I think the audience is curious to know what were the challenges you faced in your journey and what do you think are the possible challenges ahead in terms of development of capacities and competencies? Mm. Yeah, I think uh, I, 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 I'm quite extreme because uh, I'm actually quite a blessed person. I know exactly what I want in my career. Uh, I, and what I need to learn as a palliative care nurse. But I really, really hope to see what is really lacking, even in the uh, last decades or two, is really um, my own interest, for example, is really developing care in the nursing home. Yeah, you talk about palliative care provision in nursing home, it's still very fragmented. Yeah, it's all decided by whether the management level, whether they are propel or not propel. Yeah, so it is not something that is standardized across, though that prevent access to to it and many nurses that general nurses that we train they really really want to do they know that they can do so much in their basic day-to-day -day care but they are prevented by those systemic barriers so they lose their skills so I, I'm just hoping that really is there any way that for example even nursing homes um, whether through AIC or through ministry or anything really is really standardized some like a basic mandatory thing like access to drugs has to be really pay, uh, like say nurses who are trained in let's say basic basic palliative care, yeah, what can they do and then map out something for them so that they'll be more comfortable and the most important is really I also see myself right now as a role um, because we can see the challenges so that even as a nurse in a specialist palliative care team, we also have that social responsibility to help the um, other partners to grow because palliative care is something that you cannot, it's not like hard to steal skills that you can actually impart. It, there's a lot of soft skills that we really, really need to handhold people. But current model of care doesn't allow us to do that. 
yeah yeah so so that is uh, the challenge but and that's also our hope <laughs> yeah mm. thank you miss sylvia thank you yeah. so much for your sharing and your time with thank us today you. We have come to the end of our keynote speeches for today. May we now invite Mr. T.K. Udairam, President of the Home Nursing Foundation, on stage to deliver the closing speech. Mr. Ram, please. First, uh, let me wish you all a really good afternoon. I know it's the end of the week, so I'm standing between you and going off for the day. So. Uh, Thank you for taking time off from your really busy schedules. And I know that most of you are involved in care. And care means it's, it, it never stops when you finish work for the end of the day. Like, it still carries on right? with you. You start thinking about what you're going to do the next day, what you're going to do with the patients that you have had to deal with, and so on. So we hope that you found the lectures and discussions useful and relevant. Uh, we're actually very grateful for the panel of speakers. Uh, expert speakers for providing valuable personal insights and inspiration of various aspects of end-of-life care. Other than end-of-life care, Home Nursing Foundation has started to initiate forums and interdisciplinary learning platforms on caregiver support, um, function and safety, mental and health, mental health, dementia care, complex wound care, and various other topics which are very pertinent to uh, frail homebound and nursing homebound seniors. Through regular hosting of continuing professional education, uh, webinar sessions for healthcare professionals, we hope that you would actually gain, uh, you'll be able to share and gain knowledge as well from each other. Because at the end of the day, although nursing and health services in Singapore is now really huge, the number of people in palliative care and the number of people of end of life care is very, very small. It's still a very nascent um, service, as far as I can see. Right? So it's, 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 it's going to take us a long while to get to where we think we need to get. And please remember that uh, I think um, I, a few days ago I heard Minister say it's one, one in six who is above 60. It's now going to be one in five. And in a lot, not too distant future, it's going to be something like one in four or worse. I used to say in Changi when I was running Changi that every year the patients in Changi grow older by one year. Um, it sounds odd, but the thing is that the younger patients are all being treated as outpatients. More and more of the patients you see in the hospital are elderly. And unfortunately, hospitals are not designed today to really care for the elderly. Um, if a patient gets into the hospital, uh, they decondition very fast because the acute care is taken care of. Nobody looks after the the need for the patient to be cared for for the rest of the non I don't want to say non medical non um, the non acute part of the care right how do you look after the 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 the, the amount of muscle loss that patients has within a week the amount of muscle loss that the patient has you have an older patient going there and I can tell you it's bad uh, my mom went in at when she was about 90 something, one week in hospital and from walking she became wheelchair bound. It took a long time to get her back to, to be able to mobilize herself. So there are a lot of things that uh, at Home Nursing Foundation we see. We think there's a lot more we can do. And I know Christina has a challenge trying to keep up with all the things that we see is going to come and it's going to come to us like a tsunami. Right. So we really need to start thinking about how we're going to manage and we're going to expand the scope that we provide, the care pro, pro, that we provide to our community. Our first webinar series starts on palliative care and we are currently hosting a webinar series on functional rehabilitation for frail elderly in the community. We welcome all who are interested in these topics to join our webinars and to use the platform to learn and share their knowledge and, with other healthcare professionals. To build our capabilities at HNF, we are developing interdisciplinary car ah, sorry, um, tongue got twisted. Interdisciplinary care pathways to address key issues such as end-of-life care, caregiver support, and the link to draft the link to the draft of the interdisciplinary care path for the end-of-life care can be found in your program sheet. Uh, we invite you to give us your 
suggestions and feedback that will help us to improve on that so that ultimately it's a live document that we can help to continue to uh, make better for everybody. We are eager to continue to grow our medical capabilities, or I would say actually clinical capabilities. It's not just medical capabilities, it's clinical capabilities. Because it's, it's even for the people at home to develop some of their clinical skills. Because the caregiver also needs clinical skills, right? Um, uh, I always have this funny this thing where we say that we train the uh, helper and the person in the home to do rouse tube feeding. Then we say that anybody who is in a hospital, we need to, we can't train anybody who is not a nurse to do rouse tube feeding. I'm like, why? You know, there are so many care providers in, we can bring into the hospital to help us to do things like rouse tube feeding. There's a lot. So my thing is, hope is that we don't try to do everything ourselves. We try to empower our community. We try to empower the people who are caring for the elderly at home. And as, and as they age, we train them to do more, that they improve their capabilities as they need it, rather than to try and give them a whole series of lectures and say, okay, you're trained. It doesn't work that way. The skill sets only come by practice. And so for us, it's going to be a journey, I think, that we need to take to change mindsets for people at home and how to take care. And the other challenge we all have, uh, I think the ministry is also having this discussion, we're building more nursing homes. The reality is we cannot build nursing homes as fast as the people age, one. Two is, as you heard just now, most people prefer to pass on at home. But the homes are getting, the families are getting smaller and smaller. So you have an 80-year-old person looking after a 90-year-old, 90-year-old passes on, or even the 80-year-old passes on, and the 90-year-old is left alone. Or the 90-year-old who was being cared for passes on, and then the 80-year-old is left alone. So these are the things you're gonna find in, in, in the community. And I think that for us, the, the, the lessons we have to take from all of these is we need to start pushing the boundaries in all the services we provide to try and make sure that we help the people to try and adjust. And in some cases, we may need to keep on raising this and knocking at the doors of AIC, knocking at the doors of MOH to say, hey, this is a population that needs to be managed. And it's not so much as we want to train people to look after their people at home, but there's nobody at home to look after for them, for us to train. So what happens? If they go to a nursing home, today, <sighs> Nursing homes, or it used to be the nursing homes were the end stage. They go there, but people stay in nursing home forever. Uh, when I was running Changi, I used to have patients coming to the ED department for nursing home who have been in the nursing home for the last 20 years. And that should not be. They should be staying in the com community until they come to the last, maybe the last couple of years, so that we use nursing homes pr appropriately. But I think that the biggest gap is how are we going to help those small families to manage when they have to look after the elderly at home. So that's a challenge. Um, I hope that through these efforts that HNF is putting together, we can better address the evolving needs of our patients, deliver quality and holistic care and support and empower patients and family to age joyfully in the community. It's good for us to sit down here, take a day off from what you're doing with all the elderly patients and even the younger patients who need palliative care. Don't forget there are younger patients who also need palliative care. That we actually take a break and do some of these to keep ourselves fresh, keep ourselves abreast of what's happening around the world and see how we can add that to our portfolio of skills that we have. And I hope that uh, this has been useful and we will continue to try to put in more um, programs that will help to build on what we have today and we have been doing for the last few years. So thank you very much for spending time with us today and I hope it's been useful. I again would like to take the opportunity to thank all the speakers, panelists uh, for their invaluable support to try and make this a success. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ram. May we invite you to remain on stage to present a token of appreciation to our speakers and panelists. We will invite the speakers and panelists on stage one by one. May we first invite Dr. Neil Han Yi, please.
very much. Thank you. Dr. Neil, may we keep you on the stage for a group photo after this? We will now invite Ms. Chi Y E on stage, please. Ms. Chi, may we invite you to remain on stage, please? Yeah. We'll be doing a group photo after this. Yeah. Can, we miss, can we invite Ms. Sylvia Lee on stage, please? Can we invite everyone for a group, group photo session, please? Thank you, Mr. Ram. Thank you to our speakers and panelists. We will also want to take this opportunity to express a special thanks to Dr. Diane Meyer, as well as Dr. Angel Lee and Dr. Karen Lau, who had to leave earlier. With that, this marks the end of HNF's conference, Through Sickness and in Health, a conference of end-of-life care for the homebound elders. We hope that you have spent a rich morning with us with the insightful sharing from all our subject experts. Before you go, there will be a QR code shared on the screen. We hope that we can take a few minutes of your precious time to provide us with some feedback for today's conference. Like Mr. Ram shared, HNF has embarked on our journey with the integrated thematic care pathways. Our first pathway on the end of life care is now published on our HNF website for your kind feedback at www.hnf.org.sg. We hope that you can help us to take a read at the document and provide us some constructive feedback. Last but not least, our Grant-A-Wish fundraiser campaign is currently ongoing and we would like to appeal to you for a donation to our worthy causes and provide our needy patients opportunity to enjoy the upcoming festive season. With that, we thank you for taking your precious time off today and we hope that um, you have enjoyed the session. To our Zoom audience, a big thank you to you as well. Please take care, stay safe, and we wish you a pleasant weekend ahead. Thank you. Thank you.